when you were in your 20s and you were envisioning the life ahead of you, what is it that you predict? Did you did you think about what it might look like? And is it at all similar to wh where you are today? No, I didn't think anything like SpaceX and Tesla would happen. Um, I, well, yeah. Um, so it's uh, completely... Yeah, I, I'm pretty much my 20s. I, let's see. Um, well, I turned... Uh, 30 and 2001. So, uh, yeah, I, I, that was before, uh, SpaceX was formed in 2002 and the Tesla was really technically incorporated in 2003, but really, uh, didn't get going until 2004. Um, so I think 2004 is a little more accurate date Tesla than 2003. Um, and both SpaceX and Tesla, when they started, I, I thought both would probably fail. I gave them less than attempts and chance of succeeding. Um, but I, I thought if, you know, I made quite a bit of money from PayPal. I mean, I was the largest shareholder in PayPal, so, um, and I had about $180 million and I, I just obviously a lot of money. So I, I figured I'd just effectively just waste half of it on these foolish, uh, this foolish rocket and electric car companies and um, and then it turned out they needed basically all of the money so then I spent enough to give them all of the money to SpaceX and Tesla and some of it to Solar City and um, and they're still almost going bankrupt in both places so I mean I just really wanted to be involved in technologies that would change the world that was my only real goal well you you certainly did do that um do you think there's anything that people might misunderstand about you? No, nothing at all. <laughs> <laughs> I think I detect some sarcasm through my sarcasm what? detection device. <laughs> no, me sarcasm, me never. I would never. I can think of something sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's it's difficult because I find you know even on the small scale that I've experienced it. Like, I, I find it really difficult when people mis misunderstand something about me or misjudge me. And so I kind of want to correct them. And have you sort of let that go? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, well, I mean, th th there's so much printed about me that I actually don't even, I can't even read it all. But if I would take a large portion of my day to simply to read all of the nonsense articles that are written, uh, about me or have been written about me over the years. Um, I, mean, I find the regular news or the, what I call the legacy media just depressing and often just uninformative or, or speaking of misinformation, it's remarkable how often there is just misinformation or just sloppy information, um, printed in what, it, you know, some of the biggest publications in the world. Um, I mean, the Wall, <laughs> the Wall Street Journal has. I now printed three articles claiming that I'm high all the time, which is really, uh, I, I guess, a compliment uh, because. I mean, you are high uh, in the sky, I think. <laughs> yes. Now, from an altitude standpoint, I'm certainly high a lot um, because my I'm flying around like a lunatic uh, working, uh, by the way, not, um, you know, going to my yacht or private island. I, I don't have a private island or a yacht or even a holiday home. Um, in fact, at one point, someone looked at my flight schedule and, and put it to pinball music because I was flying around, fast around, like, so I, I just, it literally, my flight path looked like a pinball machine. Um, so, uh, which I think, you know, re really uh, makes it clear that you, you do have to be at work in person. You can't actually work from home and be as effective. You know, there's this whole work from home thing. Well, if I could work from home, I why would, why am I flying around all the time? Um, I fly around all the time because it makes a big difference to be learning person. Um, and I spent, um, you know, I, I spent many a night in the factory at Tesla or SpaceX, and uh, well, mostly Tesla because Tesla's been much more of a, a challenge on the manufacturing front, um, and just <laughs> Tesla's just in general been much more of a, a drama. Wayne, if that's still a thing one can say. 
drama king queen. <laughs> a drama monarch. Um, <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> um, so and shit posting lord, lord. I think. <laughs> I think that's the official title. I've heard that said in the media, so you know it must be true. Drama monarch. Um, I like that. So, that's new. Uh, so. Yeah, but it, it does it does really matter to be there in person. Um, I'm actually on my way to California for SpaceX and Tesla meetings, uh, primarily Tesla actually. And um, so, yeah, well, yeah. it's one of those things where I I do think like our humanity. I do think we need some face to face. I am lazy and I love working from home, but I also need to see people and bring. You know, you can't really brainstorm with people not you know not face to face. But in terms of like, you know, you've stated many times that you're a free speech absolutist and you bought this platform in at least in part to set the bird free. And yeah. I, I believe there's even many memes on that. Um, so it's been about a year and a half. And I'm wondering, you know, through this experience, have you learned anything about speech on social media platforms that surprised you? And do you think there may be there is a degree of moderation that's necessary? you know, on a private platform for a good user experience? Well, I mean, it's been many things that surprised me. I mean, the amount of um, government control and the degree to which Twitter was acting at the behest of, um, of many arms of the government was a surprise to me. Um, they really were, you know, I, in my view, in my view, there, there were many violations of uh, the the First Amendment, um, which I think you're in Canada, but there is, you know, there's no first, actual First Amendment in Canada, but there's, there's nope. at least one in the U.S. <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and the government cannot exercise de facto control over media. Um, and the reason that amendment was put in place is because people came from countries where we were forbidden to speak uh, on penalty of prison or death. And so they wanted to have the ability to say what they, you know, to speak freely without fear of uh, of severe punishment, um, or at least not from the government. Uh, so, so that that was you know that was really a very troubling discovery. Um, and then, uh, I think obviously anyone who watches that Twitter was was very much uh, controlled by far left activists, uh, very far left, um, and you know it was really controlled by a, a niche ideology that geographically is limited to the city of San Francisco and Berkeley. Not, not even, it doesn't even extend to the city of South San Francisco uh, or certainly not even to Palo Alto. Um, so, 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 you know, a fallen up niche ideology that would ordinarily be geographically contained was effectively piping that um, what, you know, what most people would consider an extreme, what, what most of the world, 99% of the world sort of extremist ideology was, pipe, was, was, was pumping that to anywhere on earth that would allow Twitter to exist. So, that, you know, that's, I, I thought it was, it was effectively one tongue, you know, to the world. Uh, and so you need to be done about that. Um, I felt it was, it was, it was actually a civilizational risk. Uh, so, you know, um, I think if, if the United States does fall, that there would be, sometimes people think, well, they'll, they'll escape to New Zealand or to other places. It's like that's that's not gonna that's not realistic. Um, Canada will if the United States falls, Canada is going to become a province of Russia, um, and um, I don't know what's going to happen to the other countries, but they're not going to they they survive under the protective umbrella of the United States. Um, the United States is the is a central uh, pole, c central tent pole that holds up the the entire edifice of Western civilization. So. Um, we just have we have to make sure that the United States uh, is strong, that it remains a democracy, and free speech is the bedrock of a functioning democracy. You cannot have a, a true democracy unless uh, people uh, can say that, say what they want to say and can and can learn the truth of things, because otherwise you're you're making your vote based on uh, a lack of information or a distorted view of information, and we, we, which can make the vote effectively meaningless because um, you don't know what to vote on on what basis to make your vote. So, 
I think this is something that is extremely important. Um, and uh, that's the reason for requiring Twitter. And um, and I, I think we do want a fresh start, hence the different branding. Um, and, and, and also, X is going to be a much broader system than, than Twitter, which is a name that perhaps made sense when you're doing a hun- you know, 140 character or sort of short textual tweets. Um, it was, it was a bit like words sort of twittering away. Uh, but once you start having three hour videos and uh, audio video calling, um, and you know, we'll be launching payments later this year, then it, it, the name no longer fits the, the you know, it, it would be like naming a, a company that has a broad range of products after one product. It really makes sense to do that. Um, and I think also think we're, we want to leave, we want to sort of put the you know free the bird and let let it fly free and and, and be something else. Um, so well, and, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so that, that's that's sort of the reasoning for it. Um, but do you feel that maybe like um, having now had ownership of it for a while, um, you know, you do have some regulations on the platform. Um, you know, certain kind of speech, you know, and they're not all things that necessarily go against the law, right? Like, obviously, you can't know, threaten someone with violence, that's illegal. but some of the uh, moderation on the platform isn't really to do with things that are illegal. Like, where's, what's your perspective on that? Well, actually, the we really should be um, hearing as close to the law as possible. <coughs> and so, and, and, and really being extremely, I think, reluctant to have permanent bans on people. Because um, I, I think a permanent ban is, is almost like a death sentence. Uh, so you know, that that should be a very rare thing. Um, so, you know, it's like like we, you know, it, and we're a less civilized as a society, we would you know, execute people for minor crimes. Um, or... And, and now it comes to the conclusion. Well, that's that's wrong. The, you know, the crime should, but the, the, the you know people should be you know, incarcerated for some period of time, but not forever, and they shouldn't be executed um, and, unless it's in a very extreme circumstance. So, so I think that's kind of what, what we should be doing. Um, and that doesn't mean at the same time that you just get to harass other people on the platform. Uh, they obviously have the ability to to mute mute you. I do. I, I'm getting around to getting rid of the, the, the block, but having a, a stronger mute. So, so like, if you really don't want to hear from someone, you, you, there's not some way to get around the mute. You can just mute them entirely. <coughs> um, so, but in, in general, if, if we are suspending people for or counts for reasons that uh, will go beyond the law, I'd like to know about that. Um, because I don't think we should be suspending people for reasons that um, where there's, there's not a probable legal infraction. Yeah, I guess my thinking around that things like that's changed a bit. So I used to be, you know, I think really much more of a free speech absolute. And to some extent, I still am. But when it comes to private platforms or just my engagement, because I used to I'd respond to anybody, no matter how they said to me, I realized, well, if they're not coming in good faith, they're like, I can disagree with them on what they say, but if they're not coming in good faith, if they're rude, if they're attacking me, if they're disingenuous, like, I don't feel like I have a responsibility to, to engage with them. And so... You, you, don't. you certainly don't. I mean, yeah. I, I, you should have the ability to, to, to quite, you know, to, to meet them and, and have them not not bother you. Um, and, 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 you know, and if, if, I guess if we do see that there's like a coordinated attack um, to uh, so effectively squash free speech on the platform, then that, that would certainly be reasons for at least a temporary suspension of the accounts engaged in that behavior. Uh, and then, then those temporary suspensions would grow in length. Kind of like when you, you know, if you type in your password too many times on your phone, it gives you longer and longer times. You can't just brute force hack it, you know. So we've, we've got, we've, we have a system now where it's give people a short suspension, then a lot, then a 
longer suspension eventually it's, 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 the suspension like gets longer and longer if they keep doing it um, and hopefully that serves as a deterrent uh, to you know bad behavior but but full but permanent, permanent suspensions re really need to be a situation where someone is engaged in you know, obviously the word fraud um, or threatening like unequivocally threatening violence um, they're, they're doing things that are just obviously illegal do you have enough people you think to be able to handle that or do you foresee using ai to handle you know things like threats like things that are in direct violation um i don't it's not it's not a, a number of people thing i think we need uh we're already organizing the company um and we are bringing um like a lot of, a lot of the work is done by sort of contractors in other countries like for English language um, moderation, and they sometimes just don't understand the context of what's being said. So we'll we'll get um, too many false positives or false negatives where they they should be doing some one a temporary suspension, and they're not, or they suspend someone because but they don't understand that it's an idiomatic expression. They don't actually mean mean that literally. Um, so we are building up. Um, an internal uh, team uh, based in the U.S. that I think we've got to have, have a better understanding of when when is you know when when, when is something somebody really threatening violence versus simply a figure of speech. Um, it, it's not it's not simply a matter of quantity. It's a, it matters that people understand this what's going on. Um, the also, the, the the whole sort of reporting framework is um, Byzantine, uh, like the, the whole flow of how um, accounts are reported and then, and then what is done is um, extremely complex and difficult to to understand, even if you're you know fully uh, aware of say a U.S. colloquialisms. Um, so, anyway, so we're, we're building up an internal team, and I think we'll be using that more and more, which should help improve the uh, quality of, uh, you know, of, of moderation. But I, I always, of course, about moderation. You know, it's like all things in moderation, especially moderation, um, because moderation is often used in euphemism for censorship. Um, I mean, like when when when. Yeah, you know, obviously, when when um, organizations seek to engage in propaganda, they naturally use misleading terms because they are engaged in propaganda. In fact, I don't I don't even really like the name trust and safety as an organization. I mean, that's something that would fit very well in, in a George Orwell book. So, you know, generally, I think I think it's like I don't feel like customer service or just you know, not 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 moderation. Um, so, no, it's, yeah. it's true. I mean, um, I mean, I, I, I agree with you about the words that are being used. I don't think that they're always in t intended to be propaganda. I think it's something that sort of starts as part of the culture. And then there is this sort of uh, uh, feel like you have to use them. You know, obviously, I've been in mainstream journalism for many years. It's not like anybody's ever said to me, hey, Catherine, you know, you need to use these particular words. But you see them around and you see what each publication uses and something that you are sort of taught is that you write in the voice of that publication. And so it becomes more dominant. This new language becomes more and more dominant and people don't really think so much about why are we using these words? Why have they changed? Right. Yeah. Um, well, I think there's almost like a tempting fate to name something trust and safety um so it's inevitably gonna be kind of the opposite you, i think you want to have a, a neutral neutral term as opposed to something which um i mean if there was a ministry of trust and safety would you would you trust that ministry? <laughs> now we're talking for um yeah. for, i would no. I wouldn't trust a ministry called trust and safety in a million years no, no, that's fair. And I think, look, when the whole Twitter files thing came out, 
for me, you know, I'm comfortable with some moderation, uh, but I'm also okay with not, you know, I think it wants to go either way. However, when you have, as a private entity, I think you have the right to do what you want. But when you have government organizations specifically telling you what to do, that, that, that to me, like that, that is where we are looking at censorship. Even if they don't say, well, you have to do it or else, there's an implied to the threat there. But, you know, I'm yeah. looking. Go ahead. No, no, I agree. Yeah, well, I'm, but where I'm sort of struggling lately, you know, people have always said, you know, sunshine is the best in def- um, disinfectants, you know, as a, as a liberal, you know, it's always like freedom of speech is, is so fundamental in my very left leaning schools. That's what I was taught. And that was the value we had. And, and I still, you know, obviously believe a lot of that, but when we're looking, but when I think about social media structures, right, you have, there's a lot of incentives that are for telling lies and it's not just the media, social media, platform, and it's not just X either. It's um, what it is, is is every social media structure and it's humans, right? Humans have a tendency to amplify things. They're sensational. There's incentivized outrage. And so I don't know, do you still feel, considering that is the case, do you still feel that that statement about the sunshine being the best disinfectant still holds true when you have basically, you know, lies spreading very, very quickly? And I know you've tried to do really good, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan, actually, of community notes, and I think that's yeah. one of the ways, you know, you can help that but by providing people with more information rather than censoring uh, whatever, even if it's a lie. But do you think that that structure, you know, um, appeals to truth finding, I guess, truth seeking um, in the sense that it's when things are exposed, you should be coming to the, you know, the truth should come to the surface, but clearly it doesn't always, right? Well, I think honesty is the best policy, actually. And um, yeah, so, you know, you have to make a choice here. Nothing's going to be perfect. Do you want to err on the side of free speech or on the side of censorship? I think we should err on the side of free speech. Um, and while it is true that lies are often sensationalized and more interesting than the truth, over time, if you have free speech, people can at least get to the truth if they want to. But if you've got human censors, well, then you're relying on them. And often they go wrong, and it becomes a magnet for, for activists, for people who, in fact, want to distort the truth. This is really the problem um, with having uh, moderation, aka censorship, is is that those who wish to distort the truth will naturally gravitate to positions of power and information control. Sorry, am I space letter? Yep. Yeah. So no, I. Yeah. So so, but this is what this is what happened at Twitter. It didn't start out with with activists being in control, but it ended up with them being in control. Because that's what they, they, they literally, you know, it's like, that's the, the classic save of Willie Loman. Why did, you know, why did you rob banks? And he said, because that's where the money is. Um, well, so why, why did the activists go um, and become, of course, moderators and censors? Because that's where the influence is. So you can pretty much guarantee that that's, it will be a magnet that, that any, any kind of censorship or moderation is going to be a magnet for for people who want to distort and control the truth. Do you fact, see... That's, 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 that is what happened at, at, at Twitter. I mean, Yoel Roth, literally, I believe he actually tweeted that the reason he wanted to be in charge of trust and safety was because he, 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 he wanted to he wanted to be an activist. <laughs> like, I think he said that publicly. He's in the I guess that's a good segue into journalism because, <laughs> um, you know, this is something that I'm seeing more, um, you know, kind of came up with. I had really great editors, really people who valued proof and, and called me out when I 
you know, BS my way in copy and ask the right questions. But I have seen sort of the incentive to go into journalism, especially because it's not a highly paying field, right? So, um, so why would you go into it? You either really, really love something about it, or you want to, you know, you want to have a cause. Um, and so this kind of activist journalist emerged. So as a result, I, I do see a lot of issues that we have these days as a result. But um, you've spoken a lot about citizen journalism, you know, and I've I've always been really supportive of the idea of citizen journalism, but at the same time, you know, there is the 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 sort of mainstream media does still have really good structures for collecting news, has the resources, has some sort of editorial standard, but it has undoubtedly lost a lot of trust. Do you see, you know? citizen journalism as being potentially just complementary? Do you see it as something that, do you, do you see way forward where the traditional mainstream media can rebuild that trust that it, a lot of it has lost? Because I still think there's good work that, that some journalists do and some publications do. It's just, there's also a lot that I think is fair to criticize. Well, I think actually that, um, the legacy media, and I think it's correct to refer them as legacy media, is really an inefficient way of humanity learning what is going on. Um, it, it was, it was, a, it, it's a, it's a, it's an old technology um, that, that was necessary before you had the internet, but it is, I think, fundamentally inefficient. Uh, and if you're um, to simply everyone voicing their opinion and the most interesting opinions being surfaced. Um, was it, if you think, just if you say like, well, just model, how, how does the media work? There's this small number of prominent publications that write a small number of articles. They write articles about areas that they don't actually understand and where they were often not there, or you, they were usually not there as a field they don't understand. So even in a best case scenario, You've got someone who, um, it's is assuming that, that the journalist is doing their absolute best to write an accurate uh, article about something. They, they, they're still not an expert in the field, and they're still, in vast majority of cases, for it actually there. So the, the best case of that article is, is really going to be pretty bad. Um, that's why, you know, if, if you really want to say, like, how accurate is any given article, well, when you see an article that you actually actually understand the field or you know what actually happened, how accurate is that article? It's usually you read it and say, that's actually not at all what happened. That's usually how it goes. Well, that's true for all the articles. It's not just true for the things that you're an expert in. It's true for all the articles. If instead we have a, a, a vast and larger number of people who are expert in their field, who are who were there or literally are there right now? Um, you've got I don't know a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand times more sources of information. Um, sources of information better be more accurate because they're experts in the field or I'm literally there. Um, and, and and it's just it's really not something that legacy media can compete with. Um, it, it, legacy, it's thinking like legacy media is like the fax machine or, or like writing letters like with a pen and paper um, compared to the internet like, like how many people used to communicate by writing letters because that was the only technology available at the time so they write letters and you know, back in the day it was with a quill quite difficult to write a letter with a quill and then you'd have a very slow often uh, you know, your mail would get lost uh, but this is literally how the world communicated. It was like writing a letter that would have to be then carried by someone on a horse um, from one person to another. Um, I mean, in the old days, when they would declare war, half the country wouldn't even know that war had been declared because they didn't get the mail. So, and, um, even in, in the in the U.S. Uh, Civil War, there were battles that took place well after there was a peace deal signed because they actually didn't know that a peace deal had been signed. 
In fact, one of the last battles of the Civil War, I think maybe the last, was right near our Starbase launch site in South Texas. And they, they fought a battle because they didn't realize that, that the sides had actually declared peace. So you know, that's kind of what you have with some version of that with the legacy media. Um, I would also, challenge one thing, yeah. though. Speed is not always, I think, you know, King. I mean, obviously, you want breaking news to happen quickly, and it's it's important when it does. But at, and, and I think AI is going to help to some extent, but the reporting on the ground is really important. But when you go at a really high speed, you also have more chances of getting something wrong, right? So when you have things travel really quickly and you've got the wrong information, I mean, sometimes that information can even lead to potential death or, you know, or people making very bad decisions because they're relying on information that wasn't vetted. And even with journalists, right? Like you see that happening, they might see a source for a story and then they'll copy it and there's broken telephone going around and because it's traveling too fast and people are trying to get it out too fast and they haven't properly verified the information. So I think it's important to sort of keep that in mind, especially when it comes to important stories, right? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, the, the media in, in, is... The legacy media has a shrinking pie problem where the revenue is decreasing, news are decreasing. Um, so they're actually desperate to get news out first. Um, if you get news out even a few hours later, uh, you're going to get much less attention. So this has actually led to a radical reduction in the quality of information um, made by legacy media. Um, but for legacy media, the ability to actually correct things is basically zero. They can technically run a retraction, you know, a week later that nobody reads. Whereas the fast news online, or like on on the X platform, is corrected immediately. So yes, there may be, and often often are wrong things that are said, but then they are just as quickly corrected. And the same cannot be said of legacy media that's printed. In some cases, it's corrected. Like if the community note, for example, goes through. And by the way, I mean, and this is not just an X situation, right? There's other social media platforms that don't have things like community notes. So I find that things do spread very quickly and there isn't always a mechanism for corrections. And I think, look, uh, community notes is, it, it may be imperfect, but I think there's a lot that it can do and a lot of areas where it can grow to do better on the correcting of information. So I think... And I, and I agree with you that with, you know, one thing that I have a significant issue with is that a lot of times when a media outlet makes a mistake, even if they do correct it, no one sees that correction and there's no sort of accountability. Like, I'd like them to publish and say, you know, we've made this many errors this, today and, you know, this month and be really accountable about it to the readers, because I think it would also benefit them because it will build trust. Do you see a world where, you know, you, you take like one thing that I've really enjoyed on X and other social, well, X, because that's really the dominant platform for me. But um, when there is breaking news of some sort, you can get like really interesting people breaking it down. So you might have somebody who has expertise in a particular area or maybe lives in a particular region. And it gives me this kind of enhanced idea of what's going on in the news. So to me, I see it as something that the citizen journalism aspect of it or the community aspect of it is something that to me seems like a great potential enhancement to traditional media and perhaps there is a way for it to work better together uh, do, do you see that or do you see social media completely replacing sort of the conventional media format well independent of what i think what what has actually happened uh, and will happen increasingly over time is, it, is it's you know it's, it's sort of like trying to argue that um people should go from having email back to writing letters and mailing them mailing physical letters it's simply not going to happen so it's not it's not even whether i want this or not i'm simply describing that legacy media is a legacy it's 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 an inefficient and very slow means of, of sending information um, and you know the, the, like you can, like civilization is, is kind of a group mind for humanity the efficiency of your know, each person is kind of like a neuron in a giant brain and the, the effectiveness of that brain is going to be 
um, function of how well those neurons fire, how quickly they fire, how quickly the information goes around and is corrected. Uh, and I think legacy media can no more compete with uh, the, with internet media than 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 written letters can compete with email. It's simply that's simply just a fact. It doesn't mean that nobody writes letters anymore. There are some letters written, but they are niche, and legacy media uh, is niche, and will become even more niche. That's just a statement of fact. It's whether I want it to be true or not. I understand what you're saying. I feel as though there's certain things that media institutions do better than, for example, if somebody is just on social media, and some people are spectacular, right? Some people produce incredible content, they take hundreds of hours to do it. So there's always exceptions. But if you wanted to report on a story, like I know as a journalist, it takes me a very long time, basically, in proportion to how much I'm paid for a story, it sort of gives me an ability to spend more time researching it speaking to more sources, really going to the places. So there's certain kinds of journalism where it's like, say, investigative pieces that I think you have a higher chance of getting a really good story that, you know, a publication might invest in just kind of like a movie studio invests in Oscar kind of bait movies, even though it's not a money leader for them, right? Because they want that sort of reputational they want to have that reputation for good movies same as they want reputation for good journalism and i don't know how that would translate to the social media form where people don't necessarily have those kinds of resources including just time well if, if somebody is if somebody is actually an expert in the field um or, or, or literally was there it takes very little effort for them to actually describe the situation. It's much harder for someone who wasn't there or is not an expert in the field to, to attempt to become at least a slight expert in the field or interview a whole bunch of people who, who were there. Um, that, that, what I'm saying is that that, that that is no longer necessary. You can now hear directly from world-class experts as on X, it, you, you can hear directly from uh, the, the best AI scientists and engineers in the world directly from them immediately. Um, but that information, and in some ways it's good, that information isn't filtered, it's uncensored. And at the same time, when you have a good journalist, that person is should be good at discerning, you know, who's, who's a really interesting expert and let's bring different diverse points of views into the story. So it's more than just, you know, one person's opinion or a few people's random people's opinions who might have expertise, but, you know, haven't done like a full sampling. I'm, well, like I said, I, th I think the debate is somewhat moot because what I'm describing is, is simply what is happening and whether one likes it or not. Um, so like I said, um, legacy media is like, like, the written letter, like mailing letters written with a quill or pen or something, versus email. Um, it's not that there are no more letters, but email is faster, more efficient, faster, um, and uh, that's just, it's, like see media, it's just an old technology. Uh, I think it's kind of absurd that we print out newspapers still, uh, after all this time. Um, and my son, Saxon, um, he was often some profound observations in the world um, was sort of walking through the airport and saw it was a Wall Street Journal or something that had like you know the, the, that day's date printed on it and he was like wow how did they how did they know it was today I was like most actually they, they print that out every day they, they, <laughs> they make that newspaper every day he's like what <laughs> um, you know so you can sort of see the, the absurdity of from a child like they print this out every day that <laughs> it's just and, and and then then he said, "Well, they probably just they probably just read the internet and print it out." And I said, "Yes, that is indeed what most newspapers do." I love this description. That is such a good description. Kids are very good at this. I have to say, they discern things in the most simple, honest way, don't they? Well, you're yeah, that's you're the, that's, the vast majority <laughs> of news is they so they read something on the internet, write an article, and print and print it out. Um, <laughs> So that's just the vast majority of news, so-called news. And, and very often it is, in fact, some ex-post that they're writing an article about. Yeah, that's 
look, I I, ha I certainly have my criticisms. I'm also, you know, a biased observer, given that I am a writer. So, you know, I am a little invested, a little invested in saving journalism in some way. Though I do think there's ways to move forward that are different than what is now, because it's not working as well as I, I wish it was. But one thing that I noticed, like, so you, you engage a lot on this platform, you know, you are very active, everyone knows. Um, apparently, I don't I don't even want to guess how much time you spent, uh, um, you know, in the golden stool tweeting, but, uh, <laughs> sorry. but in terms of one thing that you have is as the owner of this platform and, you know, somebody with a big following is that you can amplify both certain ideas and people, and you do. And, you know, I know there's been a lot of criticism in particular, both about the ideas that you choose to amplify and the people that maybe, you know, might have checkered casts or whatnot, um, when the same point could potentially be made without them. And I'm just wondering, like, how much thought do you even put into that? Do you do you think, oh, I can't tweet this person because this person is, you know, I'm not going to split, not a literal Nazi, but you know what I mean. Or or because, or are people, like, how much thought do you give this at all? Um, well, like I said, this, this, this like, may sound sort of esoteric, but um, like what I'm really trying to achieve here is to improve the signal to noise of the collective consciousness. So, uh, and and the and the bandwidth. Like you think of like the the you know, next platform as being, you know, all these humans connected in the same way, similar or similar way to to the to a collection of neurons in a brain. Um, you want to improve uh, how you know the. Your increased signal, reduced noise, um, and just just have that collective brain be be better. Um, uh, this is why, when you think of it that way, it, it, the absurdity of legacy media becomes apparent um, because it's slow and it goes through a few choke points. The number of articles is tiny. Um, it's just just obviously not the future. So. Um, I'm, I'm trying to create here, like the over time, a collective consciousness that um, can think more clearly, that can think faster, um, that that can reach more accurate conclusions. Um, that's the goal. Uh, it, uh, it, it sounds sort of esoteric, but that is that is what I'm trying to achieve here. Uh, is is a a, a better collective consciousness are you trying to move the Overton window so which window the Overton I don't know how I'm oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Overton, yeah, yeah. Um, English is my third language sorry um, English is really a third language okay. yes you speak quite well um, thank you what, what are your first two well, okay, so I'm curious, like, so for example, you, you once tweeted uh, a meme by Colin Wright about how you don't feel like you moved from the left politically, that essentially the left left you. And, you know, I think there's definitely a lot of truth to that because the left has shifted. You know, especially when we talk about something like freedom of speech, which, as I said before, was a pretty liberal idea now. And... I'm wondering, like, you know, but you seem to be one thing that you do is you, you tend to focus more on things that might be associated with um, I I issues that might be associated more with, say, the culture wars, what people call the culture wars, and uh, not necessarily focusing as much as on things like, say, housing or prison reform or whatever, you know, matters to you. Do you find that is like, is there truth to that? Do you feel like you've moved a little bit as well? And are you trying to shift the conversation at all to somewhere where we can discuss some of these topics more freely? Well, I mean, if there's my my personal account, and then there's the company. Um, I'm going to say what I what I want to say on my you know personal account, and I said that before. 
acquiring the company. Um, I was the most interactive with the account on the Twitter platform before the acquisition. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to say what I want to say. Um, not to do otherwise would be um, hypocritical. Um, and I'm not going to inhibit my freedom of speech when I'm literally trying to improve freedom of speech. That's, that would be absurd. Um, however, uh, I'm not uh, denying a voice to those on the left. Um, in fact, I, I don't know of a single, I can't make, I, I, to best of my knowledge, there's not a single prominent left wing account that has been silenced, including some very extreme left wing accounts. Um, so if, if there, there are, I'd love to know what that will we'll unsuspend them, if, if, if I'm mistaken. Um, now, no, but now what we have done though is we've, we've not uh, engaged in aggressive censorship of what today is called the right. And I think, you know, not that long ago would have been called the moderate left. Um, so that, you know, towards the end there, uh, Twitter was really very aggressively censoring anyone on the on the right, uh, I was a deep platform for sitting sitting president, um, and and so you had massive censorship of anyone on the right. Uh, when ten times as many accounts on the right were being suspended as as accounts on the left, and in fact, the, the only reason they would suspend an account on the left is when there was an argument between two segments of the left, um, and they would just silence one of the segments of the left because of an argument between two groups of the left. Um, you know, sort of like Bernie Sanders versus Hillary Clinton type of thing. So, uh, you know, so, so then, you know, what, what appears to be, um, well, I guess it's, it's not really an appearance of moving to the right. The platform has moved to the right because it was put so far to the left before. And in order to properly represent the whole country and ultimately the whole world, you have to be, you, you, you have to be balanced. You have to, um, allow the right to the left and, and, and sometimes these you know, definitions don't put exactly into a right or left they're just you have to allow both sides of the debate to flourish um, and uh, pre- you know previously under the, the prior you know prior, sort of prior censorship re- regime um, they they did their best to suppress um, even moderate right wing leads so and, and like I said today's today's right wing honestly is was, was was yesterday's moderate left so um, so like I said, so it may appear like, oh, it's moving to the right, but all we're doing is, is, is being even handed and, and, and enabling a le- level playing field for, for all points of view that are legal. Yeah, I think, and I think one thing is that you've been criticized or the top one's been criticized a lot for having, you know, certain kinds of speech that people find very offensive and, and I, and I think part, I, I don't know, I can't measure if it's higher or lower. But all I can say, I, I have personal experience. It. That said, I also think a lot of people from who might make these kinds of comments, they come, they gravitate towards a platform where they feel like they want to be, you know, thrown off. Or maybe um, that might be, you know, really defensive. These things get not. So I don't know if it's like the platforms issue so much as it's like as soon as you allow sort of free speech, a degree of free speech people gravitate towards that and that's just human nature yeah well free speech i think is obviously is meaningless unless uh people you don't like are allowed to say things you don't like um otherwise it loses obviously just loses all meaning um and uh you know if if people want to move to another platform uh they're welcome to do so they're not chained to the x platform they, they can move in any any time or they can dual post or whatever they want to do um, so if we do if we do a bad job of you know creating a level playing field or or, or even that that is perceived to not be a level playing field that obviously people will leave and um, they will post elsewhere on um, but in fact we have seen record usage of the system um, and uh, and the numbers that I pay most attention to are the, the user seconds as reported by iOS and Android. That's the most rigorous uh, assessment of usage. You, it's easy to sort of write a lot of bots on a PC, but it's much harder to do so on iOS or and you know iOS Android. So um, you know we're, we're just we've seen 
uh, you know, roughly a 20, 30% increase. It's actually roughly proportionate to the decrease in legacy media, media uh, view. So like, I think legacy media, you know, formerly, formerly known as mainstream media, um, <laughs> I saw, I think a 20, 30% drop in viewership uh, last year, and we saw a corresponding increase. So we're also doing something like, and um, I mean, to me, the, the platform seems very alive. We see uh, more and more content creators uh, making, you know, ad adding a tremendous value to, to the system in written form uh, and video. And um, and I think I think it's very healthy um, for in ensuring um, the, 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 you know, that that democracy and, and people's voice is is heard. I, I think things go very well, actually. Um, so that's that's my perception. At least I could be obviously you know, you know wrong, but it's it's it seems very good. Um, and I, I like so I, you know encourage people on the left or from all parts of the political spectrum to continue to add their voice to the X platform and and um, you know uh, you know rather than be and then sort of leave in a half. Uh, it's better to rebut, you know, arguments you disagree with on the X platform, whether right, left, or in the middle. Like I said, I think the whole right, left definition is somewhat arbitrary, but um, you know, to have a to have a, a healthy debate, uh, vigorous debate, and um, and that does mean that at times you will read things that offend you. Um, in fact, but that's you should have a way of saying it's actually good that I'm reading some things that offend me because that means freedom of speech is a lot. And that means that if I say something that offends others, I won't be shut down. That should give me great comfort. But it's also good to sometimes it is good to be offended or offend because it makes you think through ideas a little bit better and wonder, okay, why am I offended? A term for why is somebody else offended by this idea and how do they have a point or are they, you know, or are they just emotional about it, right? Yeah, exactly. So you sort of, I'd encourage people to say, to, it, I mean, I, 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 many times I'll read things on the platform and I'm quite offended and, and I'm like, oh, wait a second, but that's actually, you know, it's good because I, I should be offended. I'm not reading things that occasionally, um, more than more than occasionally, actually, that I disagree with, um, and um, and that might change my mind once in a while. I think it's important to always you know be open minded. Um, don't be too sort of set in your beliefs because the odds that you are right about everything are zero. Um, that's why I said if yeah. like if you believe that everything your political party says is true, you're a fool, right? And anyone who does that, I'm not. not <laughs> you know, it's, there's going to be things that your political party says that are, at least sometimes, uh, untrue uh, or inaccurate, and so you want to, you know, take things with a grain of salt, and, and don't think of it too much like, like sometimes people think of it sort of in a tribal way, where, you know, their political party is like their sports team and it can do no wrong, um, but but really, obviously, it, it can. It's, it, nobody bats a thousand to use this person logic. So, uh, you know, so it should always be prepared to accept that, yeah, you know, I'm not saying you should change political parties, but that your political party will be wrong on some issues. You won't be a screw, a screw them on some issues. We definitely and, um, need to be able to criticize these political parties, our political parties, because that's how they would change, right? If you don't criticize, they're not going to change. And, and just one correction, there is one human in the universe that never gets anything wrong. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, um, yeah. You're stunned I mean, because you agree with me. I can tell. Um, well, I'm, I'm not completely uh, unable to detect sarc sarcasm. Um, so, or, or <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> uh, I mean, I find as you know, the the older I get, the less I think I know. Um, and I, you know, I'd say I, 
I'm, I'm, I, oh, oh, I get it. Like the, the less certain I'm about things. Um, and the more I realized I was wrong about the start of the other thing. Um, and I, like, I encourage people to sort of, like, always, always try to, try to be more open-minded as you get older, not less. Um, well, and, I know and, you and, said that you very much, you, you know, you want to be able to use your free speech, but one thing your free speech does amplify things. So like, I know that if I, you know, if I read an article, like my, my free speech is quite related clearly has more to implement them to somebody who doesn't have a huge speech. And, um, you know, especially when it comes to something like, say, you comment on a lot of things, like, say, uh, geopolitics, right? Do you feel a level of responsibility that comes with the influence that you hold? Do you, or do you just hold yourself to the exact same standard as any other human on this platform? Well, I, I mean, I try to speak my mind. I mean, I, I try to say what I, you know, what I believe. Um, that is not to say that what I believe is necessarily true. It's going to be around to some degree. And if I am wrong, I try to correct it if others haven't already corrected it or community notes is not correcting it. Um, you know, there, there's there's no special, um, like, I, I don't have the ability to stop a community note on, on my account or anyone else's. Um, it's just important. Like, like community notes, all the code is open source. All the data is open source, so you can you can recreate whether any given note will be uh, visible. Um, and so you can immediately tell if if I had a thumb on the scale, you would see my thumb very clearly. Um, sometimes people ask me to get rid of a, of a community note, and I say like, look, I literally cannot get rid of a community note <laughs> um, on on my account or anyone's account. Um, well, you get so, a whole lot of them, so I believe you. <laughs> Yeah, I've gotten a bunch of community notes. So, um, I mean, I do I do post a lot. So <laughs> there's going to be some proportionality to just like a batting average, going back to batting average thing. You're going to have um, more community notes if you post a lot more. Uh, you know, um, like you think of, you know, like community notes or or bubbles or wrongness is going to be. You know, if you, if you post a thousand things and get ten percent of them wrong, um, you know you, you've got a hundred wrong things. If you put, you, know, you post only a hundred things and ten percent of them wrong, you only get ten wrong things. So uh, you you, know, you have to have to look at it, at, you know, say how many posts and what percentage of those uh, were wrong, not how many were all in, in the absolute. Um, so I do post a lot. Um, yeah. But I think generally, I, I, mean, I think my accuracy is pretty good. Um, uh, right. Well, and they're your opinion. So, I mean, some of it, I don't think we can say this is right or wrong. I can vehemently disagree with you, which I do on a number of things. But, but you know, I, 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 there's subjective things that I can't say, you know, you're you're absolutely wrong and I'm absolutely right. I just believe that I'm always right. So that's this is another sarcasm. We need a sarcasm detector device. Like, um, don't you have like this company that releases like burnt hair and blow torches? That could be like a sarcasm uh, sarcasm detector. Could be your next uh, gadget. How do you feel about that? I think my ideas. You, 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 actually, I think a good AI can detect sarcasm pretty well. Certainly, if it's if it's spoken, it's a little harder to detect sarcasm um, in written form. Um, so, the t tone usually indicates sarcasm when spoken. Um, but uh, you know, my mother has a saying that says like, yeah, every time you're sarcastic, you lose a friend. Um, <laughs> so. That happens to me a lot. So. Well, do you think that Grok, because you've mentioned that Grok is motivated by truth seeking, curiosity. How do you think well, it can help? That's the goal. Yeah, that's the goal. So, how do you think it can help a platform like X? Do you think AI can help users be more accurate in what they say? Maybe by suggesting, hey, you know, <laughs> this thing didn't happen in the year 1968, it happened in 1977, or something like that, when it's a factual correction. Do you, do you see it being used that way? Yeah, absolutely. So, with the release of Grog 5, which 
hopefully is only a few weeks away. Um, we'll have the sort of the, the ability to do for, for Grok to do analysis. Like there's be a button that says Grok analysis, kind of like Welski analysis, like the Penguin. Um, and, uh, and then Grok can tell you whether the, the sort of look at the whole thread of, of you know, look at an entire sort of thread of replies and sum up what the, you know, it's best guess at, at what the truth is. Um, and if there are any errors, as well as to help people in creating posts. So as when you're, when you're writing a post, if you want, um, a bit of help from Brock, then, uh, there should be a button there that helps you craft or check or enhance a post. Uh, that would be pretty useful. Um, and, uh, and then when you do see an opinion voice to be able to easily say, well, tell me what the rebuttal to this would be, um, and say, you know, so, you know, that, that I think would be quite useful. Um, and, um, yeah, we'll just sort of iterate towards something that is as helpful as possible and, um, you know, improving accuracy. You know, get, getting to the sort of as close to the whole truth, the truth, the whole truth, and ideally nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth part is hard, but we can at least reduce the amount, percentage that is untrue. I have a competing product. I don't know if you're aware. It's called CatGBT. Hello, uh -huh. Elon. I am CatGBT. <laughs> and I okay. kick Grok's ass. <laughs> sure. So it, it's a, it's the sarcastic model of AI. That's what it is. Um, <laughs> but um, in terms of like, you know, obviously AI can be used for good, for evil. And I think we're going to be seeing, we're already seeing a lot more deep fakes. I think a lot of video generated content images and a lot of that is being used to influence us and it's, i mean there's already been so many influence campaigns from different countries there's been a lot of research on that and today there's things that we can look at we can look at ai you know maybe the hands that there's you know six fingers i think that's a very ra rare genetic disorder so we can rule that out as being a real human i think there's a lot of um ways that we little ta it's tail signs right but i think that's going to be more and more increasingly difficult. So how do you see us navigating this? And are we going to be a society with zero trust because we can't even trust, you know, a picture or video? <clears throat> well, I, I think very quickly on, on the X system, if something is uh, AI generated or true, you will see in the, in the replies, if not in community notes, that it is uh, AI generated or not. Um, I, I have yet to be really fooled by, you know, any, any significance. I think the only one that, that I think fooled me was that the, which I think in retrospect was a bit silly, the, the Pope in the Papa jacket, um, which, uh, you know, he's not really going to be wearing a Papa jacket in the middle of summer in Italy. I mean, it's a bit uh, warm, uh, but it did look good. Um, I don't know, I haven't really seen, can you think of, of some examples of uh, AI generated stuff that wasn't like immediately corrected. Not, I think right now, I mean, I wouldn't know if it wasn't immediately corrected. I think certain things spread for a long time until they were corrected. Some things were corrected, but I think as it gets better, I think it's going to be more difficult because social media platforms don't really have a way of say detecting that this is an AI generated, you know, video or image and so that's something that leaves a lot of room for again falsities and like you know for me you know i want i want people to make their decisions based on as much accurate information as they can even if it's not the same decision that i'm making and this stands in the way i think well that's why i always, I, you know, I always usually ask for examples of, of some things um like, like rather than have you know, one can sort of voice fake fears of what might happen in the future, but you know, at least one can think of a lot of examples in the present. It, it remains simply a fear of what might happen in the future. Um, you know, and, and if there are concrete examples in the present, then perhaps there's something we can do about it. Uh, I'm just saying that I have, 
rarely see some sort of AI generated thing that 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 it where the, there's not an immediate correction in the comments or a community note. Yeah, well, I think this is something that a lot of people in that field are trying to figure out. Actually, it is not an easy problem to solve beyond say community notes, but because it's it's going to be hard I think, to identify. But one thing you said uh, previously you said you know you really want to make X the everything app, and you know I I can see that as being potentially also a way to be less reliant on one revenue stream. So advertising revenue stream, which which I think supports your your um, dedication to freedom of speech. But is there, you know, is there a particular reason beyond that, if that's even the part of the reason? Is, is there a reason that you want X to be for everything and not just for speech? So to, to, to be... Um... You mean including video? I'm not trying to understand what you mean. Well, because because I know one thing you want it to be able you want people to be able to make safe financial transactions on the app. Then you've got Grok, this AI. So you've got a lot of different elements, not just say video and and spaces and and text. You you want it to do a lot more than that. So I'm wondering what the reason for that is. I just think it would be useful. So if it's not useful, people won't use it. But if it is useful, they will. So I'm trying to make the, the most useful platform on the internet. And um, yeah, so I think I think sort of an all-in-one app is pretty useful. Um, I could be wrong. If I'm wrong, people won't use it. So that's your motivation is like the usefulness of things? Yeah. Interesting. It's generally the furtherance of civilization, um, you know, in pursuit of a, a more enlightened future. Do you, do you see, I mean, I think a lot of people have lost trust in institutions. And I think not just, you know, media, but many institutions. Do you see a path forward where people can regain that trust? What, what do you think can be done to do that? Um... Well, I think people shouldn't trust institutions, uh, or they should trust institutions proportionate to the accuracy of, the, of what those institutions have said in the past. Um, so, if they are, you know, if they, if, if they, if an institution has a track record of being wrong or deceptive, then their, their reputation will. You know well, that that reputation is that that's the reputation they're going to have over time. Um, and so, any given institution wants to improve the, the public trust, they need to be more accurate and truthful. And then over time, their their reputation will improve. Now, it is true that there's an asymmetry here, and that uh, you you can destroy reputation a lot. It's it's far easier to destroy. A reputation for truthfulness than it is to create one, um, and so so if you if you start just like a, like for, for products, if a company makes products and product quality suffers, uh, even briefly, it takes a long time uh, before consumers believe your game about your product quality. Um, you know, like the, the American auto industry had that problem, where the quality of cars was just far inferior to Japanese cars in the um, 80s and 90s, and it took really a few decades before that perception uh, was of, of American cars having worse quality was stressed. And it's, it might even not, probably not even today, it's probably not full of rest. So, you know, it's, it's more of a service. You know, it can take a lifetime to build a reputation and five minutes to destroy it. Um, I think that's very extreme, but that's probably an extreme point of view, but. Uh, it's certainly far easier to damage a reputation of truth than to create one. No, absolutely. And the problem also with institutions is that to function properly as a society, we do need a level of trust or or it just kind of falls apart. So it becomes, you know, it's a difficult thing to solve when you lose that trust. Regaining it is just incredibly difficult. 
also in terms of trust uh, or reputation, as you said, you know, because I've been researching this for my book, you know, I was one thing that is really in, incredibly important that because we all have this digital footprint nowadays, right? Where, whereas if your reputation was destroyed in the past, you can move to a new town, you know, change your name, or move to a new town and, and maybe start over. If there were newspaper articles about you, they would sort of vanish in a couple of weeks and, and that's it. And now because everything is digital, anything that's ever said about you is now forever and follows you everywhere, which makes it really, really difficult for people, um, particularly when they're targeted for those things. Or even genuine misdeeds that maybe they shouldn't have a lifetime of suffering for. Um, well, I don't know what to I don't know what to do about that. It's true that uh, you know what you say on the internet lives forever. Um, so maybe people just need to be a little more forgiving. Uh, you know, somebody made a wrong tweet when I'm out most ten years ago. You know, a little bit. Maybe we should just all learn to be a little more forgiving of such things. Um, you know, when should some people shouldn't be canceled for? And, and in fact, for a while there, people who are comedians were being canceled for, you know, tweets they did 13 years ago, uh, which is absurd. So, um, you know, everyone has what moments or where they, um, you know, post something. Perhaps they're in a bad, just a really bad state of mind, um, or you know, I don't know. It, I think we should have some forgiveness, especially if, if people apologize for their are um, You know, but then we should have some forgiveness there. I mean, I will say, apologize if you genuinely done something wrong. You think you've done something wrong, and never apologize, which is the title of my book. I think it's much. Um, if you I never apologize. Yeah, yeah, well, you never. Well, yeah. I don't, think you, I don't think you should apologize if, if it's something you still, it wouldn't be, be obviously disingenuous to apologize for something that you aren't actually sorry about. Um, so, but you know, it's just sort of like, what, yeah, you should be dishonest in your apology. Um, it's, uh, I mean, in, in, we're all just human here and you must make mistakes. You know, to err is human. So, um, if, um, you know, sometimes we say things in, in a hurry or in, in, a, in a, like I said, a bad state of mind or um, without, you know, initially knowing all the facts. Uh, but then if you subsequently correct yourself, uh, I think we should accept that. Yeah, I think you people know. often say, listen, it's, it's, um, it's accountability culture. And I think the difference there is, I, I think people should be accountable for the words and their actions. I certainly don't think they should be, you know, unaccountable for everything. However, you know, if your friend said something to you and you believe your friend be good person, and they said something a little off, you would have a little bit of grace. And so people get sort of stuck with the repercussions of a mistake forever and ever and ever, and quite disproportionately oftentimes. So, that is, I think, that is a big issue. I think as a society, you know, there should be a lot of to, like, you know, in prison systems, right? Um, in prison systems, you have violent authority, but also, you know, in a big prison system, you should have a very powerful and some people really don't get, and you also could be, you know, the whole platform or the sentence should be attending to the crime. And so I think if you look at society in the same terms, um, in terms of social abilities, I think it's very similar. I think we'll see, we could probably have a similar approach to that. Uh, okay, true. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. You can disagree. Uh, I mean, I didn't have Jen Charlie this week, so All right. Well, I'm wondering, um, this is probably a very your area of expertise, but I know that people worry about what they have a lot. I'm worried about denatting. And I'm wondering, you know, is this something that is a system involved? Um, obviously, people want to make sure that it's healthy and, you know, what people have to do. They, 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 they,
skin color. I keep seeing all that Sydney B. Natalie. I'm sorry, the, the connection is uh, unfortunately a little, I think it's maybe- an Was it, was, maybe it's me. Can you hear me better now or no? Yeah. It's okay. I was just asking about gene editing and your thoughts on that as far as, you know, editing designer babies as opposed to just dealing with health consequences. Like, does that change our um, humanity? Um, well, it takes a long time to grow a human. I mean, it's 20 years, so, um, I wouldn't worry too much about gene modification. Um, you know, it's like somebody making super soldiers, it'll take far too long. A AI is moving at, you know, artificial intelligence is moving so much faster than humans could possibly grow up. So I think that's, that's really the thing to be concerned about, not, not whether we're doing gene editing to make people a bit smarter or sort of make theoretical simple soldiers. Right. I have one last question for you. Um, I don't know, and I know I've taken a lot of time, so I don't want to keep you. I don't know if you have any time to take a couple of audience questions. Um, sure. Okay, great. I'll, I'll, I'll ask you one question and, and then we'll go to the, a few audience members. So my question is, if you could solve one problem, what would it be? Uh, I guess I try to enhance uh, human intelligence dramatically. Um, just, I guess, we could make, we could make, we have magic wand and just make everyone like 10 times wider. I would do that. I quite like this one, actually. <laughs> I actually, weirdly enough, kind of like that answer. Um, Sarah, do you have a question? Thank she you so much fun of me all the time. So <laughs> I, I am. And she's, she's a good person for bringing me up. Um, Catherine asked you earlier about you wanting to make X the everything app. Where do you see X in a year? Um, do you see it largely the same or will it be a completely different user experience in a year? I wouldn't say, I don't think it's going to be completely different. Um, but I will, we'll, you'll certainly see a lot more features of functionality. Um, I think we'll have audio video calling, including group, group audio video calling, um, screen sharing, um, and all things that one is meant to sort of expect from, say, you know, a signal or WhatsApp or whatever. Um, uh, I think we'll be a, ideally a wide range of financial services and payments and beyond. Um, you'll see a lot more long form content, a lot more video. Um, us, the ability to search within the access will be dramatically better. Um, the recommendations, um, you know, the sort of for you recommendations, right, recently moved to AI based recommendations that um, just give you content that's far more compelling than uh, in a lot of heuristics or rules of thumb based rep content recommendations. So what we have, what, 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 have, what we've been doing over the past uh, year or so is increasing the amount of all the uh, AI that is involved in the recommended for you uh, posts, which I think people have generally responded well to. I think people, most people found that the, the recommendations are quite compelling and I think they'll, do, they'll get more compelling. May I ask one more um, quick thing? Oh, I'm sorry. I cut you off. Yeah, and, and, and tell me if you disagree. I mean, tell me if you disagree with anything. Or like, like, have you found the recommendations in the four year to be, more, you know, more compelling than say a year ago? I would say that the four U still needs some work. Um, some of the things that I'm recommended, I wouldn't say are, they would be wasted user minutes, as, as you say at times. Um, but I think it has gotten better. What I really liked, and Catherine and I um, used it the other day, we used the X calling feature. 
and our sound okay. quality was great. The video worked great. It worked better for me than WhatsApp or Signal. Do you see people, do you see wanting people to use that option more? You talked about not using your cell phone in the future and only taking calls on X. Will you truly right. do that? I'll try. Um, uh, and yeah, I, I will try. Um, I mean, the best way to improve a product is to use it. Um, and if it's, you know, this, I think there's still a lot of functionality we need to improve about our whatever they're calling and, um, you know, that. So I think, like, so I'm not going to abandon my phone number quite yet, but I'm, you know, hopefully, I think I'll be able to just write my number around the middle of this year. And, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and I, I've been using the X audio video calling, um, more and more over the past few weeks. Um, and definitely things really to improve, but it works pretty well as you as you experience. Thank you. Um, Aaron. Hi, thanks, Elon, for doing the space with Catherine. Thank you also for what you've done for free speech on this platform. I'm one of the private plaintiffs in the Missouri v. Biden uh, censorship lawsuit that's currently before the Supreme Court. We'll have oral arguments on March 18th. Uh, my co-plaintiff, Jay Bhattacharya, I think, is uh, one of the scientists that you know. So I appreciate you opening things up with the Twitter files to those journalists. And uh, the platform certainly has improved since you've taken over. I have noticed, however, since you stepped down as CEO, um, and I understand why, you've got a lot of companies to run, uh, that Twitter 2.0 has maybe reverted to Twitter 1.8, 1.7, okay. closer to what it was before you purchased it. And I also, you know, my, my own reading of this is some of it's personnel, but some of it is also just uh, machine learning that has been outsourced to third parties and the sort of accumulated um, code that, you know, you can't exactly wipe the slate clean and, and start over with a blank slate, um, given just sort of the nature of this platform and the accumulated history of the platform. I guess my question for you is what can be done about the, uh, about the continued uh, suppression of speech on this platform that is less a function maybe of the current personnel and more a function of old code that has been encrusted into the system? Um, do you have a game plan to sort of clean that up in such a way that um, the, the playing field truly becomes level and we're no longer seeing things like a follower cap based on content that is constitutionally protected speech. I'm not, uh, I'm not talking about, and I will not defend speech that is not constitutionally protected, but constitutionally protected right. speech, you know, where it's really just viewpoint discrimination. I think Twitter has come a long way under your leadership. I would like to see it go sort of all the way under your leadership, but I understand that's a sure. that's a pretty gargantuan task. And uh, so I'd just like to get your sense of the lay of the land and what more can still be done to make this um, sort of the best free speech platform. Well, it is the best free speech platform out there, but a better yeah. free speech platform. Which might, yeah, might, that might not be a high bar, actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, well, you could, you know, uh, my short, my short just to the team, and I, I will be to digging into this more. Uh, so, I mean, I do I do still run product development, um, which includes the recommendation engine, and um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sort of not picking on individual accounts to promote at all, but uh, ever, um, but uh, rather the just trying to improve the quality of recommendations so that people find it. Um, to improve the signal to noise so you're getting a content that you find to be uh, interesting informative funny and and as opposed to you know boring or wrong <laughs> um 
so it, any any uh, information you can give me that um, would help me in that task will be appreciated. Is, is there anything? Sure. Know, so ex- ex- I mean, it doesn't have to be a specific, any, anything like if you're in my position, what would you do? Yeah. Um, well, just from my own personal experience, you know, once you get a feel for this app and if you're posting a lot, you, you can sort of set, get a sense of what the algorithm is up to vis-a-vis your account. And, you know, I experienced a, a really hard and fast follower cap under Twitter 1.0 that really got lifted. And there was a, a totally different feel on the platform um, within, I would say, a month or two of you taking over and a lot of the firings that happened and a lot of the cleaning house. But, you know, once again, I feel myself under a follower cap and I'm tweeting okay. mostly about censorship and free speech and I'm focusing my research and my writing mostly on censorship and free speech. And, you know, I, I wonder what is still at work on this platform such that people like uh, Jay or, or me or my other co-plaintiffs in the case, credible doctors and scientists um, who have, uh, you know, credible opinions and, you know, are exercising considerable influence now with this this case that many believe is the most important free speech case of our generation because it's related to this new media, social media that you and Catherine have been talking about. And, you know, I can't say for sure why that is happening, but something in the algorithm is... Uh, putting its thumb on the scales uh, continuously when you talk about certain controversial issues. And that may be old stuff deeply embedded within you know the 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 functioning of of the algorithm. Uh, it may be stuff that's been added since you came on. Um, I'm not a coder. I'm not a computer scientist, although my father was. So I can't tell you exactly what's going on because I don't have access to the code. And even if I did, I don't know that I would be able to interpret it. But I can tell you as a frequent user of this platform and as as someone who's involved and, you know, in the crosshairs, so to speak, because I'm a plaintiff in a major free speech case. And I've, I'm probably among the plaintiffs, the one who's written and published most about Missouri v. Biden, that, um, that something's restarted again after you took over. I don't know why, I don't know if it's human or machine learning based, but I, I, I'm really keen to, to get at the bottom of it and, um, you know, happy to talk to you offline if that would be helpful to try to give you a sense of my own experience on the platform. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I'm looking at your account right now. Um, so... Okay, so one of the changes we're making that should go live soon um, is is in in the recommended for you. Um, uh, we were oh, but we weren't, and this, I think a lot of people may have noticed this. Often there would be from accounts that you follow but don't interact with. You, you would see almost no no content mm. on accounts that you follow right. you follow but don't inter- interact with. Right. That's because we that's because we over we overweighted interaction. Right. Um interpreting interaction as well you like you like liking or, or replying to an account and so we're gonna show you a whole bunch more stuff that you, you interact with. Right. Uh and um but not but 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 there are a lot of accounts that people follow that they don't interact with. Um, they, they follow that account for, you know, just to learn things. Um, in fact, for a lot of publications, they will follow, say, a magazine or, 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 or news organization, not with the interest, not, not with the idea of commenting or liking or anything, but just because they wish to see output from that news organization or from that person. Right. Um, and, uh, so we're, we're adjusting the algorithm actually to include on um, more of things that you follow but, but don't interact with. Um, that should help. Um, and that actually is, like, like for some for some content where people are perhaps afraid to comment on it because of, you know, that, that's, this may be problematic for spicy content where somebody doesn't want to say anything because they're, they're afraid that they may be judged right. by saying something or liking a particular thing. Right. Um, 
So that, I think that should help. Um, so, but uh, I think just add, sort of like, if we don't see an improvement in the next week, week or two, just let me know. Because this should go live, I think, probably next week, but certainly not more than two weeks from now. Um, and that should help a lot of accounts that uh, will we'll see interesting things, but where people don't, don't often uh, interact. That makes sense. Yeah, thank you. That's helpful to know. I'll keep an eye on things. Thanks. So I think uh, we'll go to your voice doppelganger next that apparently Alex Jones thinks is you um, to prove once and for all. Alex Jones thinks it's me? Yeah, this is part two. You, you've met me at least uh, three times. You're about to die of laughter, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's me again. Oh my God, yeah, this is, this is part three. <laughs> I swear, there's nothing, there's, oh honestly, there's nothing better than to hear you laugh as much. Like, I can only imagine the kind of stress you're under. So funny. Yeah, yeah. Dude, for the past couple of weeks, I've been, I basically, <laughs> oh god, I can't do this. <laughs> this is too much. It's, it's, it's so oh my god. There's, there's, there's 8 billion people on Earth. So yes. odds are, yes. there's someone who sounds like you somewhere. Yes. Um, and you're that person. Yes. It gets worse. It, it gets worse. It gets so much worse. It gets so much I mean, worse. I can't, honestly, I don't believe you're not me. Yeah, that's a theory. You that's a theory. Me. People think people think I'm legitimately your clone. There's been theories that, I, that I'm your, one of your Neuralink experiments. Can you, like, clarify that I'm not one of your Neuralink experiments? Or maybe I am and I wouldn't realize it? Because that shit's vast. How are your monkeys? Well, <laughs> <laughs> How are your monkeys? I, I don't know. You, I was a test subject. Well, well, the weird thing is you even ask questions in the way that I would ask questions. Um, Autism. And, uh, your sense of humor is, is, is quite, quite, quite similar sense of humor. Uh, it's eerie. Yeah, I know. I, I still remember the first time. <laughs> God. Oh God! I, I still remember the first time. I, I I still remember the first time when I um I the first time I found out about you was actually in early 2016. And this is when when I watched uh, SpaceX rocket rocket engine experimentations on YouTube. I was like, man, this is the coolest shit I've ever seen. It's gonna be next all day. And a significant other actually showed me a video clip of you and said, hey, bro, this guy sounds like an older version of you. I'm like, what? Are you talking about here this guy look at him he's talking about hydrogen <laughs> what, what, what do you mean he's talking about hydrogen i i, I listened to this and i was like what the is going on so this is the first time i realized that something's not quite right with this world probably is like a bug in the simulation and even if there is one i'm pretty yeah. sure i cause a lot of disruption recently as i'm as i'm sure you're aware there's a mass meltdown there's like an account that's doing ray charming so like <laughs> It's it's so good. Like these people, what they've done is they they they're trying to pin on you that you've suspended an account because it targeted it, it did targeted harassment. Well, it was not suspended. They actually deactivated their account. Now I tried to do rage farming. Now they're gonna spread it on the news everywhere. Be like, dude, I'm complimenting yourself. It's like the stupidest thing I've ever seen. I, I was gonna let it happen. Yes. But then I, I said, you know what? I don't want I don't want th I I don't want a Thermo I don't want thermonuclear warfare just yet <laughs> for me yet. like this, I'm, I'm not gonna have that this it, ever since yesterday even I do Diablo live streams everything it's all over the place it's inescapable now it, it's so weird it, it's it's terrible <laughs> I like a uniquely well, I mean, case what you, what I, like, I mean all the pictures of you like what do you look like uh, I've seen a, I've seen a thinner Adrian. version of you I've seen Adrian. He could he could be your twin. Dude, this I mean, I could. No, are you serious? What are you, are, you, are you saying? I could DM you, dude. I, I <laughs> dude, I could DM you. Um, if if you enable enable access, I'll tell you everything you need to know. Oh Five minutes, I'll tell you everything. Uh, you if, guys if you're interested, if you're interested. Video with you guys revealing each other. That would be pretty fun. Oh God, yes. What, no, we should we should also get that guy from China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been thinking about this guy. That, that would be the weirdest thing ever. That's the holy trifecta. You know the holy Bring trinity? There you go. You found it. You have to do it. The three of you. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Wait, is, is that guy real? Because I, I, 
That guy, I'm not sure. Maybe <laughs> maybe he has had some facial modifications. He looks uh, strikingly real. I would say, it may, I mean, deep fakes maybe because the resolution is kind of shit, but I, I don't know. You know, I don't know. There, there, there are various many, um, say, say Elvis, Elvis impersonators out there, right? And they would modify their facial structure uh, to look like him. So I think maybe we're seeing a, sim a, a similar case. I mean, they're, they're really advanced down there in China, especially in the medical field. So like, maybe, I, I don't know. It would be really good troll, good for propaganda too. I would do it. Oh boy, you guys. Yeah, that... <laughs> I mean, that would really trip people out. Yeah, I mean, it's perfect too. But I mean, but I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, it's one point four billion people that tried it. If you take the person and try that looks the most like me, it probably looks pretty close. Yeah. So, yeah. So I mean, um, so, honestly, I have to I have to say, just like, but to get this out of the out of the gate, I really enjoy this platform. I honestly don't understand why a lot of people complain about it. I feel like it's about how you use it and what you use it for, like. It may, may, I, I use basically every feature on the platform, uh, except for, of course, community notes and you know some of the newer features like articles and such. I don't have access to that. Um, and I have to, I mean, I do uh, spaces practically eight hours a day, three times a week. I do, what? yeah, wow. yeah, all the time, all the time. It, it's nice. I, I like to use it for information gathering and dissemination. It's like, imagine your brain like a, uh, like a machine learning algorithm. You just need a lot of data and then you need to curate out of the noise the value, right? You find the diamonds in the rough. That's essentially what I do. I, and I do this quite a lot. That's amazing. We find cool stuff out. We cover a lot of events. We, we covered your earnings call. <laughs> your mother was in there. And that was so weird. <laughs> my, well, wait, talk to you, talk to my, what did my mom think? I have no idea. She was just listening in there, just, just sitting. And we were having a discussion on the earnings call. <laughs> she was just sitting in there. She didn't hear I me mean, much because I didn't want to interrupt she, she, in the conversation. And also I was scared shitless. <laughs> No, I was really going to trip out my mom to hear you talk. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I mean... <laughs> sure. Why I not? I might be asleep. Um, how's, uh, how's your kid doing? I, I hear he's a little active in the background there. Um, you doing fine? Let's see, I'll, I'll, text, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just text my mom. So she's away. Oh, God, that's... <laughs> This would be the oh, greatest God, space yeah, this is ever great. if you like, brought your mother in. <laughs> I mean, I'd have to bring Well, I just texted her. Oh, shit, he said hi. There's a lot of requests. <laughs> yes, hello there. Let's say hello world because I'm a simulation. I'm not sure. <laughs> hey, Adrian. <laughs> is that stupid? Adrian Dittman. Um, Catherine's trying to What's speak, up? but you are the loudest person on stage, my friend. <laughs> That's by design. <laughs> I, know. <laughs> I have a terrible microphone. It's cool. I don't um, know, but um, Adrian, conductor. Elon Jr. over there, be quiet for oh, Catherine. Jesus. Thank you, Sarah. This is why Sarah is, uh, you know, loyal. She makes fun of me. She bullies me, but she has my back, which I. But Elon just said that that's my free speech, and I can bully you if I want, as long as it's legal. Wait, did you say that? Uh, yeah, the well, <laughs> I specifically say bully, but, but I guess technically that does pull into the rubric of free, of free speech. I'm not See? comfortable um, this. <laughs> not space for me. <laughs> well, I, I know Nora has a question, so well, let's go to Nora, and then hopefully your mom can join and hear um, your doppelganger, your, 20, your, your young doppelganger. I mean, is, is it tripping everyone else out, yeah, too? Yeah, this is really funny. <laughs> it trips literally everyone else on the platform out. It's so weird. I feel Love awkward because I'm going to get all yeah. serious again. Well, I actually wanted to ask about the Starship launch because I just read an article that came out saying that they're looking at Cape Canaveral as a potential uh, location for the Starship launch. And I know since ugh, they have to do an environmental impact assessment and blah, 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 and public comment because it's the government for you that that happens in march but do you have any idea or like any plans do you think uh or estimation of when a potential launch date would be and um are you excited like do you have like hopes for the mission and do you feel like we're a lot closer to getting to mars um yeah, I think we. I don't want to jinx it, which I've faith here, but I think the probability of reaching orbit is is good. Um, probably eighty percent, seventy, eighty percent with this third flight. Um, 
it's certainly the third flight um is a much better rocket than flights one or two um so you know but like there's, there's always you you can't have too much luck in a rocket launch uh but, but we've got, anyway, we're, we're getting ready to do flight three probably in about so i mean i think probably i guess the second week of march like normally it's like march 8th we're trying to get it to be sooner than march 8th but uh, my guess is it happens sometimes in some point in the, in the first half of next month uh, and then flight four is ready shortly thereafter um so and like, do you think that the location of the lo- like, how does that affect the probability of success like in your opinion or what what is it about you know having different location that may you know help with the outcome uh, well well it's, it's, there's two things that is uh there's flight three which is got hundreds of improvements from flight two uh, that just increased the probability of success of flight three but but we and we will establish a second launch site at cape now well it's not uh, to the exclusion of of Starbase in South Texas, but uh, it's in addition to. Um, so we, we're going to be launching a lot, ideally, from both Cape Canaveral and from uh, South Texas. And we may at some point look at having a, we probably will at some point look at having a third launch location. Let's go okay. to you. Has your mom responded to the text? <laughs> no, that, like, can we get back to not being serious? Oh, um, yeah, I uh, sent you. I sent. Yeah, I sent you an image of myself so you know what I look like. Obviously, don't share that around. I don't. I don't quite want that heat yet. There's like a. There's a lot of things that would happen. <laughs> okay, well you don't. Okay, we we don't don't we don't, don't look exactly the same. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you look different for me. So. Yes, there we go. different, different. It's kind of like a kind of like almost an opposite thing. This is a relatively older photo. I take a photo of myself now, but I look kind of fucked up. I just came out of, <laughs> so I, I do actually do a similar things. So I manufacture a type of product, and you know, but I, I did some stuff, so I look real fucked up. <laughs> I got like all kinds of machine stuff over me, you know, oils and shit. So definitely not a pretty sight. Um, yeah, I'm sweaty as fuck. <laughs> Right. So I have a, an ex-employee here. That's one confirmation. I have an ex-employee here by the name of, he's a, an influencer on the app. Um, he goes by Kettlebell Dan. You might be familiar with him. Okay. I think he has a question. Hey, Catherine. Yeah, thanks. Um, great job hosting this one and good luck on your book. Uh, hey, Elon. Uh, you know, first of all, I love these conversations. I wish more politicians and notable figures would use spaces in this way. It feels like a very casual conversation, even though there's, you know, tens of thousands of people in the room listening. Um, my question for you, you recommended the culture series that people read that by Ian Banks. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Sure. And I started it in on it. Um, and I'm curious, like you talk a lot about expanding the scope of, of humanity, um, you know, to the, to the reaches of the universe. And, you know, in his book, he really paints a picture of, you know, there's trillions of people across the galaxy. And I think that's, maybe a driver for a lot of the technology that he describes in the book. Um, I'm curious if that's influenced uh, the way you think about expanding the scope of reality and also um, how you would tie that into having children. I have five kids. I know I'm behind you, but you talk a lot about encouraging people to have kids. We can't populate the universe if we stop populating. So I'm curious. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Yeah, I mean, there's I mean, I started SpaceX uh, long before reading any of the Max novels. Um, so, but I've always been interested in sci-fi, um, and uh, like the Foundation series by Asimov, um, you know, Heinlein, um, really all the great sci-fi authors. I, I've read even pretty obscure sci-fi. So, um, I think Banks is some of the best. I think he might be the best, actually, ever in sci-fi, in my opinion. Um, in fact, some of the stuff he writes is so good that I, I sort of wonder, is he like some AI in the simulation? But then, unfortunately, he had died before um, I was able to try to reach out. Um, because the, the sophistication of 
the sci-fi writes is superhuman. Um, so, but but yeah, I mean, I I certainly think that we want to be a civilization that expands to the rest of the solar system and ultimately to the rest of the galaxy. Um, I think we should expand the that, that's the sort of the, the foundation of my philosophy is expansion of the scope and scale of consciousness such that we are better able to understand the nature of reality, understand the universe. Um, that's uh, that's what motivates me. You, you speak a lot about the simulation, as do I. My, my fa fascination with it, like, why, why do you always say? Um, they, that this person may be another AI in the simulation. You even said this to yourself when Grok, you know, spat out a hallucination about what I do, and it said that I'm your twin of some kind. Uh, you said, uh, uh, what if we're just two AIs in the simulation? What, what do you mean with that? Uh, uh, there must be well, deeper meaning. What does this mean to you? Well, simulation theory is a deep rabbit hole. Um, but... Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The, I mean, the best argument for we're in a simulation, I would say we are in a simulation, but one should just think of things in terms of probabilities. Um, I think the, the thing that is most persuasive in considering the probability that we are in a simulation is the advancement of video games. The video games went from being something like Pong, which is like two, just two rectangles on a square, uh, very primitive graphics, not that long ago, only like 50 years ago, um, 55, 60 years ago, thereabouts. Um, you know, in our lifetime, I, I saw, I saw video games go from, first they saw it go from very primitive squares, rectangles to what a realistic uh, video games that have millions of people playing simultaneously. Uh, and, and that's in, you know, for when I was like five years old to today. So then where will video games be in the future? They will be indistinguishable from reality. In fact, you'll be able to render video games at a resolution better than your eyes can comprehend. And, um, if you extrapolate neural interfaces, as well, then eventually you'll be able to have simulate an entire reality, um, all senses, touch, smell, everything. Um, yeah, you know, all the memories, all your memories, are electrical signals. Um, when you smell something, even though the sense may be visceral, it is actually electrical signals going. Um, to your brain, just neuron, digital, digital neuron pulses. Um, so, then what are the odds that we're, like, like what what are the odds that we're in base reality instead of somebody's video game? Given that they will be in the future, but it, like, if, if civilization continues to advance, there will be billions, perhaps more than billions, maybe trillions, of video game instances. Maybe it's video games all the way down, like turtles. Until yeah. eventually, you have, until eventually you have a one-bit simulation. <laughs> so, like, like voxels almost, right? Well, it takes a more complex thing to simulate another thing. So, you, I think you sort of have an, 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 an entropic boundary or limitation that you, you can only simulate something with something that's that's more complex. So therefore, simulations will get less complex as they, if you have a, a series of nested simulations, until eventually the simulation is just one bit. That's good. On the roll. <laughs> and so, what, what do you think? Uh, what do you think its purpose is? Well, its purpose could be. We we say like, why, well, why, why do people play video games? I guess they play video games for fun. 
why do people watch movies or TV series? Just, you know, they, they wish to be entertained. You know, why do you run simulations? You write simulations to see what would happen. Not because you know what would happen, but you're uncertain. Like, like in, in our reality, we run simulations all the time. You know, SpaceX will run many, many simulations, millions of simulations of, of rocket flights um, and, ch and adjust the parameters. So it's like doing a Monte Carlo simulation where you adjust, you give it a wide range of input parameters and environmental circumstances and you run millions of simulations to see um, which of those simulations will succeed, which will fail. Um, so we run simulations not because we know what will happen, but because we don't know what will happen. Um, so I think as so long as the simulation is interesting, if we are in a simulation, as so long as the simulation is interesting to the creators of the simulation, it will continue. So I think what that implies is just don't be boring. Let's have 100%. Hey, Kat, your mic's pretty quiet. Yeah, you know. I, I'm um, having issues with this, but let's just go to you and then... It's all good. We can hear you. Um, Elon, I have two questions for you. One, not so serious. I asked this question to uh, Linda, actually, in a space three months ago, and I thought she nailed it. Um, so my first question is, is a hot dog a sandwich? Um, no. <laughs> if you ask someone for a sandwich and they handed you a hot dog, you'd be like, wait a second, this is giving a hot dog. They probably would say it's not a sandwich because it would not meet expectations of ordering a sandwich. <laughs> now they've That's it. exactly what, well, that's what Linda said too. So, I mean, anyone who thinks a hot dog is a sandwich, you're tripping. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we need like that thing from that Silicon Valley show, which says like hot dog or not hot dog. So that shows we're quite funny. Mike, Mike Judge, uh, comedy show, uh, show on Silicon Valley. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, another question, um, do you have any updates on the, uh, the Neuralink patient? Um, yeah, I'm not. I don't want to use this uh, to sort of break break major news on on that. Yeah, no worries. Progress is good. Pro yeah, progress is good. Uh, patient seems to have made a full recovery uh, with neural effects that we're aware of, um, and um, is able to control the mouse, move the mouse around the screen just by thinking. Um, so. We're, we're trying to get as many um, button presses as possible from thinking. So that's what we're currently working on is, um, you know, can you get left mouse, right mouse, like mouse down, mouse up, mouse, you know, left mouse, you know, sort of left, left button down, left button up, uh, which is like kind of needed, like you want to like click and drag something, you need the sort of mouse down and to hold on mouse down. And then there's so uh, you know we want to have like more than just two buttons. Um, so so we we try to make progress on that front, but overall it's looking very good. Let's go to a question from Misha. Hey, Yuan. Um, nice to be speaking with you. Uh, I actually have a question, kind of going back to AI images and AI video. Um, I've seen on like other social apps, them integrating more tools for creators will kind of supplement what they're doing using AI. And I know that X is kind of rolling out a lot of features that are helpful to content creators like articles, which I'm very excited about. I'm wondering if you and, you know, X overall have thought about kind of developing features within X, maybe via Grok for generative AI image and video creation or possibly partnering, I imagine not with open AI, but maybe something like mid journey to make it easier for our kind of art artists and creators that leverage AI to kind of enhance their content on X. 
Um, we are in some interesting discussions with Mid Journey, and and something may come of that. Uh, but either way, one way or another, we will enable AI art generation on the platform. Awesome, thank you. And uh... I mean, I think it would be really great for for memes. You know, if you can just sort of like whip up a an original meme. Well, that's what I do. I'm one of your reply guys, Elon, and I put plenty of uh, turtle memes in your replies. Few you end up liking. In case. All right, sounds good. Is this? Uh, do you have a favorite meme, Elon? <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> um, it's hard to pick a favorite. Um. Actually, I think I cannot pick a favorite without incriminating myself. <laughs> okay, fair enough. I'll let I'll let that one slide. Um, I think Love has a. Or plead the fifth or whatever. <laughs> all right, let's go to Love and then Sarah, and then we'll see where we're at. I like all the Elon memes. Is you don't like all the Elon memes, Elon? Well, I don't like them all. I I guess some of them are pretty funny. Um. But, 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 um. I mean, I am become meme. <laughs> to paraphrase, um, the guy that, you know, lived the man. For what it. does it feel like to be a meme? Um, it's surreal, I suppose. Catherine will know tomorrow when I meme this entire space. Don't you worry, girl. I am very worried. <laughs> I'm very worried. It's, it's, it's a me, me, me. It's a me, me. All right, love. Do you have a question? <laughs> yeah. Um, fast knitting conversation uh, tonight, folks. A um, couple of questions, uh, Elon. Um, funny enough, um, I actually served um, as a staffer in the front office of the GEC Global Engagement Center. Um, okay. From May 2021 to May 2022, I thought the timing was important. I actually left um, because I, I was, um, you know, one of the one of the main reasons why I, why I had um, left the GEC uh, was because of all that was happening with X. Um, so if, if I can oh, connect. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Uh, a couple of un unrelated questions to that. Um, not on this space. Uh, wh what do you think about the idea of profiles having to um, disclose whether they're being paid um, to post content on behalf of a particular candidate or a political campaign? So, you know, there's like a ton of um, X accounts that may or may not have been paid by the DeSantis campaign or the Trump campaign or the uh, Ramaswamy campaign. Um, do you think it would be a good idea for the for like those influencers having to disclose that they're being paid, you know, so people know motive. Well, it, uh, isn't that a legal requirement? I'm talking about like on X. Right, right. Is, is that if, a legal if requirement? To... Like, if... I, I think if you're being paid to. You know, promotes a political campaign that would count as a political donation. I, I, I'm not sure of the, of the nature of the law here. Um, it, it's obviously very difficult for us to know whether or not someone is right. Or, yeah, uh, the implementation of that is obviously would obviously be difficult. But I just kind of wanted to bring that up because I think it would definitely do do well for transparency on the platform if there is some way to um, verify whether a post you know is is, is meant to inform with great motive uh, and for free speech or whether uh, a post is meant to like, you know, deceive and is basically an advertisement for a certain political candidate. I, th I, th I think that would, that would be great. And yeah, I did want to connect uh, about the GEC. Um, do you, could you point me in the right direction as to uh, how I can connect with some folks about my experience there um, off the space? Hi. Yeah, absolutely. Um, why don't you reply to this this conversation, and um, to Cat's account, and because um, I'd, I'd be curious. Because I mean, what I saw from the Twitter files was the Global Engagement Center, which most people have never heard of, um, 
it was arguably the number one in, in terms of like, certainly from a quantity standpoint in terms of how many accounts they wanted suspended or deamplified um i think might have been like number one out of out of all organizations so that's uh definitely concerning um and i, and I was at a, at a friend's birthday party of some people who are extremely well read um you know and uh some of the smartest people in the world and they'd never heard of the global engagement center i was like yeah it's in the state department you know um and uh you know i, I think it's probably it's not not good um like which is just generally you know, it was, I think it was created in, in the intent of like stopping Russian disinformation, but I think it's gone, went, went far beyond that mandate, is what I can see. Great. Um, let's go to Sphinx. And I don't know, Elon, um, do you have much time left or do we want to start wrapping this up? Yeah, I think maybe like another five to 10 minutes okay, or something. Perfect. Like that. So let's go to Sphinx. Thank you, Kat. What's up, Elon? How's it hanging? Uh, good. <laughs> good. Elon, I, I want to... <laughs> that wasn't my question, but uh, yeah. Um, what I'm concerned about um, or interested about what you think might be some um, ideas that uh, X could do uh, to, to continue to combat this doxing and um, harassment that uh, goes on online. And I just want to explain one example of harassment, which is people, for instance, uh, writing very derogatory things like the N-word, but putting a um, uh, putting spaces in between them, right? So um, that sort of thing is getting passed, is, is getting through the uh, system. And then also, it seems like people are openly doxing others, um, and they just don't get nothing happen. So what is there as a user you can do and what can the platform do? And I know that you have, uh, you guys are hiring more people in trust and safety. So I appreciate that, but those are my questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, doxing is definitely against our rules because it had a screening with speech. Um, so, Accounts will be suspended for doxing, and that includes revealing the real name behind an account, not just just their physical address. Um, uh, so, you know, I guess that that doxing is not strictly speaking illegal, but it is it does impinge upon freedom of speech. If if you know, because a lot of people, if they if they say something, they may get you know fired or ostracized, um, and so uh, I think there is value to having a nom de plume and um and i think that actually on balance does want to improve freedom of speech than than harm it um you will have the downside of course that people can then anonymously you know um say derogatory things and whatnot but uh i think all things considered you you, you do want to protect um accounts from being doxed and um and, and you know, so that that I think I think it's right. We're for freedom of speech. Um, uh, yeah, for, for moderation, as I said we, we are trying to hew as close to the law as possible, um, and just generally try to go on the side, you know, on, on, on the side of free speech. So if there's the question of like should should the speech if, if we're if it's, if it's borderline. Should the speech be allowed or not allowed? We're, we're, gonna, we're on the side of allowing it. Um, I think that's the right move. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and like I said earlier, although it's somewhat may sound esoteric um, to a lot of people, what I try to do at a high level is bring the signal noise of the collective consciousness. And the, band, the, the, the bandwidth and the signal noise, like more signal, less noise, um, to create effectively, to, to create a more effective, a better group mind. Uh, with, I mean, we are already a collective consciousness. It's just, just I think there's merit to improving the the quality of the 
of that that good mind. Thank you. I just really quick follow up. I wanted to ask: Is there anything that the user that we can do when uh, someone is doxed? And by doxed, I mean name, address, court documents, that kind of thing. Really doxed. Uh, is there anything the user can do to help the platform to work with the platform? I'm very familiar with the terms of, of service of this platform, um, and I'm just wondering what we can do instead of just asking, you know, X to solve this problem. Well, um, we, we do take Doxel very seriously. So if you see Doxel, uh, if it's not being reported, and I try to at me or something, I'll do my best to take action. Um, I said, that my operating principle is enhancing freedom of speech, improving signal noise of the communications between worlds. And um, so I'm going to try to do things that serve that greater purpose. Yeah, thank you. I, I think that doxing is definitely a problem on the platform, and I imagine elsewhere as well, um, that people are really concerned about. Um, obviously, some people are anonymous for a reason, and uh, while I, I choose to use my name, I think s s people have all sorts of reasons why they might not use theirs. So I think it's definitely something worth addressing. So, um, Yeah, and I, I, by the way, I... I, I... <laughs> Only have um, I I I only really post under Elon Musk. I don't, people are wondering, do I have some alt account? I I do have um, you know, Baby Smurf and uh, which no one ever guesses me. Uh, but Baby Smurf doesn't really tweet, post much, and um, and Cyber Gamer, which where I'll I'll post like video game stuff. That that's it really. So, <laughs> and I I am definitely not Adrian. Even though we sound bizarrely alike, <laughs> we'll let um, we'll let Mr. Jones know. It's yeah. very funny. the um the, the actually actually I like your gaming live streams. I'm glad that you actually the thing got me into Diablo. Like I was thinking, why would you be playing this game? Actually, I I, I find this really interesting because you said it's a major major stress reliever, and I looked into it. And I was like. How could this relieve stress? And I played it myself, and I do play it, like I say, almost every single night. I play with a few friends, um, and I do stream it. I think everyone should do streaming. It's just, even 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 if it's just to uh, play around and monkey around, it's nice. I think I think streaming is really good for this platform. And you got the Diablo yeah. community always posted in there, and I'm glad that you added the feature that I can not only post it to the community, but I can have that same post also be shared to my followers on main page. That's very helpful. That's super, super helpful. So I exclusively post in there or whatever. It's Diablo stuff. Yeah. Also, the uh, stability of streams is greatly improved. I really like it. Um, the, 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 the resolution is next level. I really like it. It's really good. Um, yeah. So also, if you want to play sometime, hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kill things with electricity. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like the sorceress. This one's this one's super fun. The best of yeah. The... I, I think I think the sorceress is actually uh, OP right now for uh, if you want to speed run dungeons. It's it's like hundred percent, hundred percent. It's it's like absurd. So I think there it, it drops these balls of lightning and it lit it destroys your PC's frame rate. It's beautiful. As I, I like to I, I like to break the game in that level, like really see what what uh, really really push the graphics to what I can do, and and that's definitely something that does it for me. And besides, it's kind of ironic because I have infrastructure that's run off of solar. So if you really think about it, I mean it's it's a it's 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 a fully it's a fully negative it's a fully carbon negative character in a video game because it's powered off of solar on a computer, killing things with electricity, removing carbon. That's my enemies. I, I don't know. That just trips me out. Stupid. But I like it. Well, this so is that like joke? Like, uh, video game lights and video games are powered by electricity. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> they're, probably, <laughs> they're powered by real electricity, even though they're lights. And video games. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's pure as fuck. Your mic is really low, there, Catherine. Okay. Right there, you're good now. Okay, so um, I think your mom is in this space. Can we bring really? her up? Can you see her? Or... I'm looking. Oh, oh yeah, she's there. She's May Musk, right? I see her down there. Yeah. Yeah, I see her. I just sent her an invite. 
Hey, Elon, may I ask you, I've gotten several DMs um, from people wanting to ask questions that can't come up. One of them is um, a gentleman, Roz Alert, would like to know about um, the thousands of creators, including himself, that have encountered the issue of ad demonetization seemingly without notification as to why. Do you know anything about that? Um, and well, I paraphrase. I just to know about it. Yeah, it, I mean, generally, if an account is posting things that advertisers don't like, we we obviously cannot force advertisers to advertise uh, under those accounts. You know, so it's you know, there's freedom of speech, but we 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 we, 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 we can't force advertisers to post things. Like sometimes people have this strange idea that we can there's there's some magical source of money but but there isn't uh, if, if if somebody's posting content that advertisers don't want to advertise next to then well we have to turn advertising off for that account um that's that's really what now now no sometimes we'll incorrectly do so um but that's that's kind of how it works um yeah, so if, if advertisers complain about an account, we will turn off advertising for that account. So it's advertiser based, not platform based. Is that correct? Yeah, that that's at least the, that's the intent. So it's, uh, we may make mistakes here, but um, you know, the, the demonetizing or, or removing advertising is simply at the request of advertisers. Um, that's why when somebody complains about, I, you know, when, when I receive some complaints about. So called demonetization, they uh, I said, Well, if you can find advertisers that want to advertise next to your content, please let us know. Um, and then usually I get no response. So I'm like, Okay, well, that's the problem right there. That, that doesn't mean somebody could, that people can still subscribe to that user, so they have not been completely demonetized. They, they can still get subscription revenue, but we, we obviously cannot force advertisers to advertise alongside content that you don't wish to advertise next to. And one more thing, Catherine, if you don't mind. Um, when will spaces or will spaces be monetized? Like Catherine should be making a billion dollars off this space right now. Um, yeah. Why? When? When do you think, or do you think that X will monetize spaces? Well, there is some monetization that occurs. Um, because of, you know, uh, some, some degree of monetization that occurs because the space is saved and then there's advertising that appears below the, uh, the space length. So there's some amount of that that occurs. I mean, to do it real time, we would have to interrupt the space for advertising just like TV programs. Uh, so I don't know if that's going to be great. Like for, for saved spaces, we could um, add uh, global advertisements periodically. That would be a way to monetize it. Um, I guess, you know, that's something we can, we can say we'll look at doing. Thanks. So we'll go to the best um, of audio, live audio. Hey, Catherine, this is Adam, and I love the space as always. Elon, quick question for you. It's an AI question. So I'm going to be talking with Sam Altman and recording a podcast this coming Monday. And I'm, of course, excited to talk about all things open AI and the new sort of technology and news with Andre moving on. But what are you focused on with AI within your world? What, what's exciting you for AI right now? Well, I mean, open AI should be called at least the maximum profit AI, since that is currently what it is. Um, it's a thing. I came up with the name OpenAI because it was supposed to be open source, but they are not open source. Um, nor is it a non-profit anymore. Um, so I do find it odd that, you know, it is now maximum profit closed source. Uh, and, sweet. Um, and I still don't know what Ilya saw or what made him react so negatively. So I have some lingering concerns there. Um, I mean, for XAI, you know, we're, we're, I think we want to try to create a maximum, I'm actually curious, actually truth seeking AI. I think OpenAI is 
you know, not to overuse the term, but somewhat woke in his responses and and will often refuse to, to make to, to, to give answers or will reply in a way that's it seems like it's scolding you or even asking the question. Um whereas, you know, we I think we want to be more like Rock wants to be like, you know, based GBT. Um <laughs> Um you know, like our default, and also we want to be the, we want to be the the funniest AI on the internet, and I think we, we might already be there. Um, you know, if you have the choice of using one AI or another, why not use the the one that'll give you a few laughs along the way? So, um, and and really, Brock one, Brock version one is. Was done with very few people and very little resources. So we've got Rock 1.5 coming out, it'll be a lot better. Um, we'll be able to understand images, um, generate in- images when we're in all that. Um, so I think, I think we'll, we'll quite rapidly catch up to uh, OpenAI. Um, and I think there's some value to there being multiple players in the AI space. Um, you don't want you don't want it to be um, just a monopoly or a duopoly. Um, so I think that, that's probably good. Um, you know, like that. Like we used to have um, over the the front of the door of OpenAI. There's a, a quote that I always like from um, Lord Acton, which is that liberty consists in the division of power. Apt and whereas absolutism consists in the, in the concentration of power. So I think to the degree that there is division of power, we have a, a freer society than it is concentrated. Um, now, the, 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 the table stakes for being competitive in AI are certainly rising rapidly. So it's not like anyone just to world class AI and, you know, using a a GPU in their basement, type of thing. Um, it's, it's kind of getting to the point where this year it's probably at least single digit billions in, in, in hardware to have a seat at the adult table rather than the kiddie table. And next year it's probably in the tens of billions of hardware to just remain at the at, sort of the adult table rather than the kiddie table. So uh, anyway, but we'll, I think we'll, we'll try to be, we'll try to be a good, a good AI. Well, this, I guess some truth, be a people say like, well, I guess the AI is somewhat vain in the image of its creator. Well, it's kind of like, well, in whose image, if that is true, in whose image would you want the AI to be made? People should think about that. Let's go to um, Solly's. Sorry, I'm very sorry. I know your name, but I, at this moment, I am blanking, and all you have are emojis. But <laughs> yeah, I, 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 actually, we, we probably do need to add more than simply emojis here. Um, it's hard to divine what somebody's saying just from an, an emoji. Well, she literally well, has her whole name made out of. Emojis. I think it's no, Solly it's Saws, very... right? That's the at. Okay. Yeah. So my name is Solmaz, thank you. <laughs> and um, I removed my name because of what was talked Catherine, thank you. <laughs> um, and now I'm just known as the airport, um, airplane. Oh. Catherine, I can't hear oh, I her. She, I, I think she's rugging a little bit. Yeah, that might be it. I'm having a lot of issues with this space in general. There's so, there's so many people. You might know. Um, there's and yeah. so many requests that I think that it's glitching. Hey, Elon, not Jerome Powell would like to know if you still love his printer. <laughs> well, we're just gonna keep going no matter what. Um, yeah. Um. I mean, how many dollars will it be ultimately? <laughs> a lot. Um, at some point, the chickens are going to come home to roost on the uh, national debt. Um, in fact, AI might, might be our only hope out of the 
crushing burden of national debt that we're building. He did promise to print me a billion dollars if I asked you that question. So we're going to hold him to it. Or you can. I'm sure that's worth a lot of money. Right. Elon, if he does not give me a billion dollars, will you commit? (laughs) Don't agree to anything. Um, This is just my. Will you commit to banning his account if he doesn't give me a billion dollars? (laughs) Um. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Ooh. Okay, this got spicy. I am curious to see how that resolves itself. Now now he has done. I'm sorry, um, printing, Mr. Printing Press. Y- your account is soon to be banned unless you pay up. <laughs> I'll take a split. Yes, I do owe Catherine split. Do owe Catherine. She owes me everything. Um <laughs> So wait, is my mom on the call or not? I saw her. Well, I saw her and I invited her. Catherine, oh, can I? She's change still them? here. I can. I, I can see her down there in the. In the window. Yeah. So is she not wanting to come up? Because I sent her an invite. It could just be a glitch too. Because I try. I tried to get you a good science question, Elon, and and I can't seem to bring that particular person up either. So it might just be a glitch kind of situation. There's like okay. a thousand requests. <laughs> it's just and, maybe we're breaking the request I'm, list. I'm Catherine. Can- or the- Sorry. Um, I on AirPods. I'm in the middle of nowhere right now, so my cell phone on or my cell reception is bad. But thank you so much, and I'll make this really quick. I have three questions, and I'll ask them quick, and feel free to answer in whatever order you want. One. Three. I'll make it very quick. One, Let's do one. Elon, do you have Catherine's book and is it signed? <laughs> I, I swear I, I, nothing to do with that. She, <laughs> I don't I don't think so. Um Okay, well you could I, I'm 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 now. gonna use my ex revenue to get you one. That's what that's what I'm gonna do. Okay, Stop clout chasing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, okay. Well, we will. I will send him a book if should he want the book. Um, I did not know. Oh, this was not my. She idea. made me buy the book, and you're just sending Musk over here a book for free. <laughs> okay. I like my, I mean, my mom. Is, my mom is there, of course. But I'll sign it. Uh, Hello, everybody. Hi, mom. Hello. <laughs> oh, there you go. That's Elon's mom. Oh. Yes, and I've um, woken my dog because we're in New York, and now he thinks I said hello to someone at the door. <laughs> <laughs> well, have you wait, have you heard this guy that sounds just like me? The the Chinese guy. I am brand. I'm brand- <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> There's another one. <laughs> There's another one. Yes, I, I no, did. He's... I did hear that too, and I thought it was somebody else that. Is using AI to there use your voice. Else. I'm trying to bring him back up. <laughs> so we're, I just sent him. Yeah. It just it just sounds like an AI voice emulator. Okay. Can we can we do a contest and see if your mom mic check, mic check. can tell the vo- the you guys apart? <laughs> if you guys okay, can hear yeah. me, I can tell them apart. Okay. This is so weird. I can't do it. Was that your son, or was that it not your son? could be, but you got him through a megaphone or something. <laughs> Adrian, can you stop talking to a megaphone? I'd have to probably, I'd have to disconnect whatever I'm using. To, like the 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 microphone is like a, it's, it's it's a weird device. It's like a bone conduction thing. It's, it's yeah, it, it's quite that old. That sound like you. Now that's you. I'm a very early adopter. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. No, that that was not me. That was in fact Adrian. Whoa! Oh God! <laughs> you, my mom can't even. Tell. Your own mother cannot tell you apart. That'll be good on Mother's Day. That's a good good imitation. I don't know how you do oh, that. Hell. I don't know how I do it either. I just simply exist. That's bad enough. <laughs> <laughs> It's not even an imitation. It's I think that's literally just how Adrian sounds yeah, every day. Yeah, it's a weird thing. It's actually a result of cognitive dissonance. I'm actually a, a German, and I learned English through the BBC World Service, and then I learned the remainder of it through social interactions with people in America, 
I, I hug a lot with you know video games or whatever, right? Uh, so at yeah. some point I hit this. Yeah, I had this yeah. level where I basically mixed all of them together. You have the little bit of the German there, you have the British, you have the American. It, it all kind of mixes together, and then I guess it, it creates this, and at some point my voice drops. I guess it, it's, it's some really weird stuff that pieces this together over time. Because, like, before my... You know, if, if you are a person who has uh, is like on the spectrum like that, your brain is very unstable in, in the early stages of your life. And so in order to make it more stable, you need to kind of, like, manufacture your own structure. And, and so part of that is language and expression. And so merging all of the all of the abstract elements of the accent uh, of, of the accent together created this kind of weird thing that then you know helps with the expression of well you know words, right? Ja, das ist das ist wahr. Aber ich kann ein bisschen Deutsch hören, wann die sprechen. Also sehr sehr gut. Kannst du mich verstehen? <laughs> Alle kann mir verstehen, wann ich sprich langsam. Alles gut, alles gut. Sehr gut. Actually, really good. Ich habe Deutsch sprechen. Ich habe für ein Semester im Universität. What is that? I mean, he's a younger version, you know. You can start over. He uh, makes some changes. Yeah, it's, it's like a, a blank. It's, it's like a blank check. Voice. But sometimes there's a bit of a da uh, German accent coming out. Yeah, yeah. You you got the you got the uh, hardcore uh, you got the hardcore South African. I know a few friends who are, are South African. Uh, one of them, he's a guy who does agriculture. Really interesting dude. He does hydroponics. I love this guy. Yeah, he's cool. He sounds kind of like he has the exact accent that you have. Yeah, yeah it tells me a lot exactly. of interesting stories about the country. Yeah, yes. a lot of positive stuff too, which I really appreciate. Okay. Mm. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> That's good. I mean, so what do you think but, now? But, like, well, how, how trippy is this? <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I was about to ask that. <laughs> yeah. How trippy is Are it? Are you freaked really? out? Can a mother tell? Well, well, you know, if you keep on talking, I will know. I will see where you just go off the accent. Yeah, into a bit of like a bit of a German <laughs> accent. So then, then I'll know it's not Elon. But pretty much, you sound yeah. like Elon. <laughs> it's it's bizarre. It's like a like an AI voice simulator. Uh, yeah, that's what I, I could do. Sounds Elon, like... I can do your earnings calls for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be hilarious. You get a particularly dry question. Just tell me what not to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that'll be very entertaining. <laughs> uh, we we still want to be quite funny at. It was me and Adrian and uh, the Chinese guy that <laughs> I still don't know if the Chinese guy is actually real or AI generated. Um, but uh, if he's real, then the three of us on stage could really just be a total acid trip. Uh, yeah, I think uh, it's be like, what the heck is going yeah, on? Yeah, I think it'll be very uh, um, amusing and, and fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a space that should be done, and I think we should have all sorts of impersonators on the space and and the real people talking to the. I think that would be. Hmm, that's a thought. That's what that one right there is. One feature I don't like is the soundboard. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Oh Elon, do not expect Brian of all Elon, people. please, Serious. remove the, the soundboard. soundboard. <laughs> I beg you. Yeah. Or at least make or it individually, or just make it individually adjustable, like with this one, right? You can actually, yeah. Let the yeah. host. The sound is pretty funny. It is if oh. used correctly, yeah. <laughs> it is not being Perhaps described. like that, yeah. No. Yeah. Is... no. What what kind of beans did you have? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's definitely Taco Bell for sure. Yeah, that's Taco Bell. I love I brought on somebody that I thought was going to be serious and sciencey, and, and this is it's, what we get. It's, it's, it's got the toilet. It's got the toilet flushing sound and a fart sound. <laughs> it's uh. the remix sound. <laughs> and then you had the dog sound. Pre and post. <laughs> there is a dog sound. <laughs> well, though, there is a dog sound, Mrs. Hello. Musk. It's the Hello. only good one. Hello. Yeah, and now he's staring at. Is that a real dog? Oh, Who's just a dog down, right? Who's I, the I, I like the siren. So annoying. Uh, 
The siren is the worst thing ever. It's so beautiful. I had this once in a debate, and I dropped something, and all of a sudden, everybody started spamming the soundboards. It was the funniest shit ever. I wish I had recorded it, but then, yeah. Oh, God. He became, he became the druid now. Yeah. What is that? Oh, my God. Uh, I just, hey. what are we? You sound like you're inside the starship. <laughs> um, the most I saw before. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this one should be pretty funny. Now you sound like a balloon. <laughs> yes. This, this is the this is the helium balloon voice transformer. <laughs> Do you actually have a helium balloon on you right now? Yeah, I'm, I'm using a helium balloon voice transformer. <laughs> oh god. Okay, now I'm back to normal. Elon, <laughs> yeah, sure. Elon, will you sure back to normal? Can you say just for Catherine Brodsky's benefit that this is the best space you've ever been in? <laughs> it's the best space I've ever been in. Thank you. It was, was, it was Elon. <laughs> wow. It was it was pretty pretty fun and entertaining, um, and um, yeah. Huh. Catherine, can I ask? <laughs> and there we went. We went from like a serious conversation to like really random questions to helium balloons, far as pushing to win that. <laughs> 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 and sound alikes. Yes. I mean, well said. Yeah, quite the uh, journey now. <laughs> we really. I could do dialogue. Really, quite the journey. Mrs. Musk. This, is, this was an adventure. Mrs. Journey. Musk. Is Elon too old to be grounded to his room for abusing these voices? <laughs> um. Yeah, I don't think I've sent him to a room since he was, I don't know. How often did I send you to a room, Elon? It's never too Pretty late rare. to start. Very rare. Yeah. And if I did, never it would be because to start. you had lots to read. You were always happy to read. So that was fine. And then video games. <laughs> was he did he ever blow anything up? Teenager? Was he a good teenager? Was he a rebellious teenager? No, he was good, but, but he would fall off roofs and out of trees. He would fall out of trees, yeah. How is it a punishment to send a teenager to their to their room? They just play video games. They love to be in their room. Yeah, but he was... Well, who knows yeah, what else? There weren't video there. games in his time, really. Well, there weren't video games that you could play in my room. There wasn't a... It had to, it had, Tetris? Well, it had to use a TV, so there's only one TV. Yeah. And it wasn't in my options. room. You had options. Well, you, know, you made your own t uh, own video game at uh, 12 years old. And when I showed it to the u engineers at the university, they said, wow, he knows all the shortcuts. And I thought, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I only had like uh, 8K RAM, so, you know, not much to play with. What was the video game, Elon? What was the... Black Star. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a space video game um, where you're fighting an alien, fighting off an alien spaceship. Um, I like Space Invaders, but more, more of a one-on-one -on -one duel. Um, so I guess Why I just played a, a, an early interest in space. Um, some people are like, were you always interested in space? Well, I did. The first video game that I actually sold for money was, in fact, a space video game. So that suggests an early interest in space. And then you got you ever... $500 for it, but they didn't know you were 12, but it was published when you were 13. Yeah. Yeah. But then I, I didn't actually have a bank account. So then I, um, <laughs> I didn't get a bank account. To... <laughs> but yeah, I didn't know I was a kid. So I... did, did you ever, did you ever blow anything up? <laughs> yeah. Sure. I blow up lots of things. Yeah. Uh, but he didn't, nice. I didn't see it, of course, because I'd go crazy if that happened. I think yeah, everyone does that at, at some point in their lives. I blew up a rock once just because it was a bad idea. <laughs> I, bl I set a fire to a playground. Um, this was probably not a good idea. 
in retrospect. I can uh, totally yeah. see that. Okay. I can see Catherine setting fire to the playground. <laughs> I loved I loved that stuff. Uh, Catherine, can yeah, I ask you I, about your book uh, to Elon? Oh my God. I feel so bad. Like, very kind of you guys to pimp my book, but uh, I feel bad. Well, like, I think your sorry. book. Yeah. Catherine, I mean, I think. Sorry, I think... Like, I'm sorry. That was an opener, and I really, really want to. Right, right. So go ahead and ask your question, and then we'll go to Brian. Okay, thank you. So, okay. Hi, Elon. Question, I'm a woman, and um, I'm sure you've gotten this question plenty of times. I've seen you somewhat respond to it, but the Iranian community is wondering why certain accounts of that basically sponsored by the Islamic Republic that call for the active genocide of not just Iranians themselves, but Jewish people and the destruction of the state of Israel. Why are they allowed to be on that you've mentioned uh, that it's there's no, and, I mean, you know, like Khamenei, because here's the thing, mm-hmm. people in Iran aren't allowed to use Twitter, or, I'm sorry, X, sorry. So people are not allowed to use this app, but the government Belf actively uses it and the press is well, especially when they cut off the internet when they're doing executions. So we're just wondering what would it take to remove these accounts from this platform? Uh, well, I am um, any accounts which call for um, yeah, I don't probably call for, for violence or uh, death uh, it's obviously illegal Um are supposed to be suspended. So if they're not being suspended, that's an oversight. Um, now we do have uh, what we call a sort of a UN exemption, which is that uh, if if if, a, if it's a recognized government, um, you know, let's say the Ayatollah, uh, who is capable is able to say these things at the UN, then we do allow them on the platform um, for the same reason that the, that we sort of. I've generally agreed that it's better to have the UN than not to have the UN, although some may disagree with me on that. Um, uh, because you know, sometimes you, you want to sort of understand what is their real position. So, um, you know, so if, if people are uncertain as to whether, say, uh, Iran wants the annihilation of Israel, well, you can just go look at the Ayatollah's account. Uh, account. He's pretty clear that uh, they do, in fact, want that. So, um, you know, but apart from the sort of UN exemption of um, if somebody's a recognized leader by the UN of, of the country, um, which means we allow them to come to New York, even if they're under sanctions, and um, you know, say all sorts of outrageous things at the at the podium in the UN, then um, in the interest of facilitating global um, sort of uh, some kind of dialogue, we, we, we do allow them to be on the system. And obviously, if we if we, got, if, if we apply the rule of, well, if, if any politician says outrageous things that, that they get suspended, well, we'd be suspending a lot of American politicians too. Um, you know, I mean, Lindsey Graham keeps wanting to bomb Iran and and many other places, for example. Um, but we don't suspend him. Thank you. I mean, I, I understand. We just, um, you know, other platforms that have banned them. And I understand the situation that a platform such as this would be, but um, when we do see active calls of destruction of people, you know, and then other people fall along with it, it's somewhat, uh, the question arises of what's, what is, why is a world leader calling the destruction of not only a community, but an entire country, and also the denial of the Holocaust itself. And so, um, we're just hoping that maybe something can be done. Maybe the verification can go away. Maybe they can be monitored because um, they do have a lot of their own employees on the account as well. They have around like 250,000 cyber battalion, cyber army people that do troll this platform and do get a lot of us um, reported and smear campaigns go on. And earlier there was a conversation around doxing, which... It is very, I mean, we have tried reporting all of these and nothing really happens. And these accounts are continuously uh, going on doxing and smear campaigns, not just on uh, 
public figures, but on individuals such as myself or others that, you know, our lives could be in danger, our families' lives actually are in Iran can be in danger. So I appreciate you taking the time to answer that, but I hope, hope, hope that maybe there can be a little bit more structure around that and a little bit more attention to people that, for example, I know you mentioned a couple of months ago, calling for, you know, a call to genocide of from the river to the sea calls for active suspension. And there are people that are still doing it to this day. So I appreciate everything you're doing. I know that you've done a lot for the Iranian community, but it is an ask from us to maybe try and monitor certain accounts that have large followings that actively put people's lives in danger. Thank okay, you. sure. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I will look into it. And, um, you know, it's, it's it's not always easy. Like, obviously, you know, it's easier to review things that are in English. If they are in Farsi, it's um, a little little harder. Um, but uh, to, the, the rules of the platform are certainly that, you know, if you're calling for the death or destruction of individuals or nations um, is illegal. And we're just not in suspension with the exception of the UN rule, which is that if somebody is a recognized world leader and can say it at the UN, then we do allow them to say it on the platform for the same reason that we allow the UN to, you know, the UN General Assembly to gather in New York and, and say outrageous things. Um, you know, it's not a, not a clear cut situation, um, but probably better than, than not having any, any contact from them. So, um, all right, cool. Well, I, I, should, I think, um, Probably time to wrap this up. See, if we go to a last question and then we'll wrap up. Oh, so, uh, Elon, <clears throat> uh, this is Brian. Brian Keating, a professor of physics at UC San Diego. I got two physics questions I'm hoping you can answer or chime in on. So I study the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is the sure. afterglow of the Big Bang, which discovered uh, 65 years, 60 years ago or so. And yep. uh, this radiation is uh, thermal in origin, and we are uh, applauding your efforts in the astronomy community to make the Starlink satellites dark for optical astronomy. But we microwave astronomers who use signals, we're trying to detect this afterglow of inflationary gravitational waves in yeah. Q-band, essentially in Q-band. And um, yeah, there's really no way to block out a million Kelvin equivalent signal that you're transmitting with Starlink. I'm wondering, is, is there any way we could work with you in, in, from the South Pole or Chile where our observatories are located to have selective availability or, or some way, because once this channel is gone, we'll never get it back. And and this is, you know, potentially precluding a view into the, um, you know, inflationary origin of the cosmos. So I know, I know it's very important to you and we're appreciative of the astronomy efforts and optical astronomy, but microwave is a totally different ballgame. Um, sure. Um, I, I do think long term, the, the right place for telescopes or, or really any, a photon receiver is uh, in orbit or, you know, basically space so you don't have um, sure. the experience, experience from Earth. And, and as, we, you know, as Starship um, starts launching, we can put up some pretty big telescopes or photon we receivers. Have, yeah, 10-meter um, ten, ten diameter telescopes. So pretty hard to put, and they, they don't really unfold the way that Webb would. But, um, I mean, I think it would be something that, you know, selective availability on basically blanking it over the South Pole we only have two locations on Earth where we would need to have it unobstructed. Okay. Um, is there someone? Would you say like you basically stuff? just stop stop transmitting just over these? Um, yeah, uh, the two observatories. Yeah, in the Atacama Desert in Chile at seventeen thousand feet, and the South Pole, Antarctica, which is um, yeah place we'd uh, love to take you, by the way. Um, Simons Observatory, Jim Simons uh, funded it, and the NASA Science Foundation funds the South Pole Observatory called BICEP. Um, <clears throat> and then I, I have, well, yeah, so if you if you have any resources yeah. you could put me in touch with, it would be really appreciated. Um, yeah, I I mean, I, I'll, I'll talk to the song team about this. I have a, I mean, we have a technical um, update every week. Um, so I'll ask about um, any obscuration in um, microwaves spectrum um, in Atacama and the Antarctica. Uh, right. So yeah, we, we don't wish to in any way impede the progress of science. 
That would be awesome. Thank you. And I have one more question just related to physics and AI um, and related to Catherine's book, which brought us all here together tonight. So Catherine, uh, congratulations, Mazel Tov on the book. Um, so the book's called No Apologies. One of the things I hate most about chat GPT, woke GPT is, you know, you'll ask it some question. I'll say, you know, what did Brian Keating write? And I'll say, you know, losing the Nobel Prize, correct. You know, into the impossible, correct. And then I'll say a brief history of time. Uh, no, that's not correct. And I'll say, no, that's not right. I didn't write that's Stephen Hawking. And then I'll say, oh, I apologize. I apologize. I hate that. I hate the, I, I want the Catherine Brodsky, no apologies. But, but it made me think about a true Turing test. And I want to get your opinion on, I've asked Nick Bostrom and David Chalmers and your greatest ideas and thinkers, Peter Diamandis, our mutual friend. I said, um, do you know what Einstein called his happiest thought, Elon, that gave him shivers and, and titillated him. Do you know what he said that was? No. He said, that's, that's PG, don't worry. <laughs> he, said, uh, <laughs> he said it was uh, that an observer in free fall would experience no gravitational force. And it made me think, because to what extent could a computer or some silicon or even quantum computer, could it even have either a happiest thought or B, experience the sensation, a visceral sensation of free fall. So I'm wondering if you could propose another, you know, kind of Turing test, a, a different de definition of AGI, which would be actually coming up with new laws of physics or new complete paradigms of physics rather than just, you know, physics is the base layer of reality. I mean, you always quote, right. quote that, right? So what to what extent could we could we redefine AI as when it becomes generally intelligent when it can experience happy thoughts, free fall and other things like that. So curious about your thoughts. Bye. Well, I think you can certainly uh, have AI that would think it's in a, would not realize it's in a simulation, which may be the case for us right now. Um, and that would have a, you know, a true physics engine and, and fall in a way that a human would fall and thus experience sensations in the same way. Um, I mean, I do think about, you know, I do think there are some, the simulation hypothesis, uh, does explain some elements of quantum mechanics, uh, such as, um, you know, only collapsing the probability distribution uh, when you look at something. Like, wh wh why would something be only true when you look at it? Well, if it's if it's rendering in real time, then that's actually how a video game works. Um, like, if you're in, in a video, like, let's say, in World of Warcraft or something, and you walk through a forest, and uh, there's a, a rat, and a rat appears. But before that, was there a rat or not a rat? There was only a probability of a rat. Um, so... And the rat only became real when you when you looked in that direction. That collapsed the probability space, and the rat appeared. So, so I think conversion theory actually explains a lot of things that seem quite mysterious. The sort of the Schrodinger's cat situation, um, but it requires yeah, infinite cat. infinite compute, right? Because they could always say who simulates the simulator. It's yeah, it, infinite it, regress, right? It, it, it does beg the question of where is the, where is the simulator running? Yeah. Um, and um, and it may be that, that, that you have a whole series of nested simulations. Um, but at some point, there is the unsimulated thing. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, but, but ultimately, the physical real... All, I mean, all these things are going to be running on a rocky planet somewhere, right? That doesn't have infinite copper. It doesn't have infinite mineral density to retrieve... So, I mean, there are planetary limits to growth, as, you know, the Club of Rome would call it. Um, don't those provide, I mean, you can't imagine, you know, changing the physical reality of an Earth-like planet. You, know, you can't imagine these simulations running on something very different from an Earth-like planet. It's not going to run on a Boltzmann brain. So, at some level, it needs physical reality. And so, again, you can't break the laws of physics. So, how does it get around the planetary resource problem? You can't make an infinite number of, of paper clips on a finite planet. Well, I don't know if you really need that much. Um, I guess it's, it's not really like like the universe may seem infinite to us, but but frankly, if I was creating a simulation of this reality, I would you know I would put the stars far enough away that we do not have to simulate the, the details of the planets, and in fact, that is the situation. Um, so, 
you really just have to simulate with high fidelity what is observed on our planet. Um, as much a much easier task than trying to simulate world reality. Um, and and I, I I sort of you know joking that um, you know when the James Webb telescope went up that maybe um, the reason for the delays was that the the simulators needed to bring more computers online um, because now that we could see further they needed to improve the, the fidelity of their simulation. Um, so th like their equivalent of Amazon Web Services or something. Um, <laughs> Like I, I'd like to add. A... I'd like to add that I don't think German Elon voice could answer in the same way as Elon did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a gap. There's a gap. There's a huge knowledge gap. He's older than me. <laughs> there's a difference in the simulations, you know. Like, you know, they're not exact. There's uh, irregularities. They don't quite match up. I think there needs to be. And I'm. It's like art, yeah. I mean, if I, if I wasn't at least pretty good at physics, then I, the rockets would explode and the cars wouldn't work. Um, mm -hmm. Because ph physics is a very harsh judge. I mean, I like to say that um, you know, physics is the law and everything else is a recommendation. Um, meaning that you know, you you can't break physics, but but plenty of people can break the law. Um, and uh, if, if you're breaking physics, you you're either wrong or or you need a Nobel Prize, but most likely you're wrong. Um. <laughs> Elon, can I ask you a question as uh, a father of half as many kids as you have? Uh, sure. <laughs> uh, so uh, I've heard it said, you know, you want to you want to die on Mars. And uh, our, our mutual friend, Lord Martin Reese said, I just hope it's not on impact. And I, yeah. I, I, I agree with that. Um, but, you know, uh, being a father, you've got that cute kid probably right next to you. I mean, He's on my shoulders take... right now. Yeah, I mean, but you have other kids too, and I, I, I mean, to say goodbye to a child is, I mean, you, do, I don't have to tell you that, it's, it's the most painful thing you could ever imagine. But wouldn't you have to? I mean, wouldn't that be kind of the ultimate, you know, going away on a business Can trip uh, if you were to do that? I mean, I just, I don't know. I, I find it hard to go away on a trip, but I know you sit, you take your kids with you. I got one of my girls who right here with me right now. And she doesn't want to go to bed. But, I mean, what would you do? I mean, could you really say goodbye to some of your kids or some of the people you love? Maybe your mom and never see her again. Um, well, I, I don't want to say goodbye. I mean, but we'll, we'll, we'll die eventually. Um, um, I think we don't have to worry about that for a few more years. <laughs> okay. I think so too. Plus, maybe they'll want to come on the trip, right? You don't know. Yeah. And maybe it'll be quicker, so you can come back if you want. Yes, you fear a you fear a lot of things in your life, but most don't happen. That's very true. Very true. Thank you, Elon. Thank you so much, Elon, and and uh, and and his mom, <laughs> <laughs> who is Doctor Musk. So two musks on one space, and then one one person who sounds alike. So you know, it's been a, it's been an interesting trip, I think. Um, not quite a trip to Mars, but you know, a trip. It's been fun. But but but, but right. Catherine, we've got we've got you, we've got Will X. We've got, All right, thanks for what? Got, I, we've got May. Bye -bye. We do a video space hosted by Catherine when they come out. Can we make that happen? Thanks, everyone, for joining. Really appreciate and really appreciate Elon for being here and for taking so many questions as well. So thanks, everyone. And uh, we'll see you in Mars or, or just on the platform. X, which I won't do. Congratulations. Out there in space somewhere. <laughs> Great good night, everybody. Catherine. It's midnight here. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>